How are you? I am good. I am good. So how was the I donation fortnight today? With it's going on actually. <laughs> it's on the other side, and uh, not today. I am behaving like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Google time. It is eight zero five. It means okay. five so, minutes past eight Bangladesh standard time. And okay, India. so we can start. Yes, we can start. I okay. hope uh, our moderator, Dr. Shams Muhammad Noman, he will introduce all the uh, panelists, speakers, uh, president and host, and also our guest of honor. I will request Dr. Shams Muhammad Noman uh, to start the introduction. Uh, Asif, Asif Shahib, what you are doing? Your face to your Facebook page. Okay, sir. Hello. Okay. Okay. The slide is visible? Yes. Uh, yes. Honorable host and chairperson of this session, honorable guest of honor, honorable chief guest, and uh, Honorable panelists and speakers, welcome to the session, The War Against Trauma, episode one. Why it is uh, war actually? Why this trauma, we are taking it in war? Because it is less cared, it is at time consuming management, outcome is variable, and sometimes anesthesia is a great factor. Possibility of infection, facility is not available each and every fire, like investigations and also management. So I am delighted to introduce our chairman and host, Professor Mahmoud Sharfuddin Ahmed. He is professor and chairman of the Department of Community Ophthalmology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. He is also president of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. He is the president of Bangladesh Community Ophthalmological Society. He is also the president of Oculoplastic Society of Bangladesh. He is the first secretary general of Bangladesh Medical Association. He is also the president of Bangladesh Ophthalmic Research Forum. It's my great pleasure to introduce in front of you, Professor Abba Hussain, our motherly, our leader. She is director, come chief consultant of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh Eye Hospital. She is president elect, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. She was past president, Sark Academy of Ophthalmology. She was past president, Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. She was the founder president of Bangladesh Community Ophthalmological Society. She is the receiver of prestigious Ali Memorial Gold Medal from Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. And she is also a proud receiver of Apollo Achievement Arthur Lim Award. I am really honored to introduce in front of you our special guest and speaker. Professor S. Natarajan, she, he is the Padmasri Awardee, very prestigious award of India. Uh, it is, uh, this award is one's dream actually. He is the chairman and MD Aditya Jot, I Hospital India, he is the president, Organized Medicine Academic Guild, past president, All India Ophthalmological Society and Ophthalmic Trauma Society of India. He is the secretary general, Global Eye Genetics Consortium, the Board of Trustee, International Council of Ophthalmology. He is also the President of Asia Pacific Ocular Trauma Society and Shankar Netralai alumni. I am introducing Professor Rajesh Sina as a panelist. He is Honorary Treasurer, All India Ophthalmological Society and Sark Academy of Ophthalmology, most responsible post. He is Professor and Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Service, RP Center for Ophthalmic Science, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi, India. I am introducing my friend, Dr. Amir Awan from Pakistan. He is consultant, ophthalmologist, and retina specialist, Shifa International Hospital, Islamabad, Pakistan. He is associate professor of ophthalmology, Shifa College of Medicine, Pakistan. I am introducing uh, Professor. Deepak Kumar Nag as panelist. He is professor and head of the department of Vitro Retina, National Institute of Ophthalmology and Hospital. 
is the chairman scientific subcommittee of ophthalmological society of bangladesh is a proud receiver of motin gold medal asia pacific academy of ophthalmology distinguished service award i am introducing dr tariq reza ali as a panelist he is associate professor vitro retina bangabandhu sheikh mujib medical university is the secretary general vitro retina society of bangladesh is a proud receiver of motin gold medal harun memorial award and fazulok memorial award of ophthalmological society of bangladesh i am really delighted to introduce uh, dr gitali sandiani adriano my friend he is the vitro retina consultant uh, department of ophthalmology faculty of medicine university of indonesia sipto mongokusmo hospital indonesia jakarta eye center indonesia i am really honored to introduce in front of you professor dr partho vishwas as a speaker is director bbi foundation kolkata chairman scientific committee all india ophthalmological society the chairman academic and research committee all india ophthalmological society is the proud receiver of national and international awards like colonel rangachuri award escrs best paper award all india ophthalmological society uvhs best paper award apcs video award and boa gold medal award i am also delighted to introduce dr parthopatim dr mojumdar as a speaker very favorite to our bangladeshi people he is also bengali he is the senior consultant department of uvia and intraocular inflammation shankara netralaya india founder kamchi editor of popular ophthalmology portal www.uopta.com it is also very favorite uh, website for our ophthalmologist and he is the proud receiver of natrajan pillai award and kr dutta award for his academic excellence uh, i am really uh, honored to introduce in front of professor abdul kader as a speaker is the secretary general our fabric leader of ophthalmological society of bangladesh he is professor of cornea national institute of ophthalmology and hospital he is the proud receiver of fazulok memorial award from ophthalmological society of bangladesh and this is dr priya narang as a speaker he is very famous you know he is director narang i care and laser center ahmedabad india chief editor of the book anterior segment repair and reconstruction is the gold medal winner from iii iirs si and gold award from the indian journal of ophthalmology for his um, papers and academic excellence and he is a uh, 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 writer of different books i will tell later on and this is me uh, dr shams mohammad numan and the senior consultant and head of the glaucoma chitokong eye infirmary and training complex and the member secretary of bangladesh ophthalmic research forum general secretary of ophthalmological society of bangladesh chitokong and i am the council member of sark academy of ophthalmology so i welcome all in this webinar and i think we will start our uh, session okay i'm uh, stop sharing yeah. okay. so now i am requesting uh, professor abdul kader uh, 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 i am requesting uh, professor sharfuddin ahmed to tell something as an introduction professor sharfuddin ahmed the floor oh, is yours thank you, thank you uh, moderator uh, dr shams mohammad noman uh, it's my pleasure to be with you as a chairperson and host of this webinar which is uh, in such webinar that war against trauma war uh, we have seen uh, as we are in the same region we all know uh, bangladesh uh, india pakistan uh, nepal also china everywhere there is a uh, war but this war against trauma i think uh, here this webinar will give us such idea that in war there is the many lives become uh, many one die but in this trauma 
the death of the eye means loss of vision. So this type of uh, webinar will help us to restore our vision. Our guest of honor, and he, she's the panelist, and also she is the president elect Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, we welcome him in our webinar. And next, a special guest is Natarajan, and also a speaker. I welcome you in this webinar, and uh, I hope other uh, speakers and uh, panelists, which uh, whom uh, our moderator has already introduced, and I hope. Uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, India, all are together in a global village. We hope this type of webinar will be uh, continued as because we ha you have seen that this is the episode number one. Uh, I hope uh, uh, our speakers and our panelists will enrich our uh, all the ophthalmologists as well as our residents who are participating in this webinar. Uh, in future, uh, all other things like uh, what is the manifestation of co corona in different uh, or uh, ocular manifestation of corona in different uh, countries uh, in Bangladesh, in India, or uh, in other countries uh, like China or in Europe. We can have an webinar in future like that. Today, uh, I hope the traumatic cataract, trauma to the cornea, retinal detachment, the trauma to the iris, everything will be discussed in such a manner that it will not be only beneficial to our uh, ophthalmologist, it will be very much beneficial to our future ophthalmologist, that is residents or trainee who are uh, now working in different institutes of this region. We are now living in a globe, a global village. So the latest informations about all uh, treatment and uh, diagnosis of our you know, ophthalmic uh, diseases that will be easier to everyone. I will not take much more time. Again, I welcome all the speakers and panelists and all the attendees who are with this webinar. I hope uh, I, uh, you all will be free from COVID and you will uh, live long with a healthy life. With these few words, thank you very much. I am requesting uh, Professor Abhav Singh uh, to tell tell something uh, 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 before starting our webinar. Professor Abhav Singh, Madam, please. Hello. Yes, Madam. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Noman. It is really a very great honor and pleasure for me to be here today and address you. My heartfelt thanks to Professor Sharfuddin, chairman and host of this webinar for inviting me to this wonderful and outstanding webinar. This webinar is so much great as because Professor Natarajan, he is the leader and he is really a very great leader as because just few days back, I have seen, I was in that uh, uh, platform, that is ICO launches the uh, International Leadership Development Program, whereas Natarajan is the person who is the main coordinator and he coordinated in such a way, the great leader all over the world was there including Ivo Kokar and also the president of the ICO. So I am really very happy and uh, thanks to Professor Natarajan Then yesterday we could not start due to the internet problem, server bar problem and all of you were waiting there. So thank you so much for coming here today. There is a great session, that means five panelists, five speakers, and one moderator, one chairperson, and one guest of honor. In such a way, the war against trauma will start. 
and this trauma this is very much uh, this is very much uh, in my heart from the very beginning of my career from 1981 and when i was in national institute of ophthalmology at that time the place where all the emergency ocular emergency have referred to that institute at that time nowadays there are so many uh, institute and emergency occurs all over but at that time in 1981 at that time it was only the national institute of ophthalmology and i was there for 17 years so it is very uh, much um, for me it is very great thing that i have seen lot of trauma from the very beginning of my career and the thing which hurt me very much that is the very uh, the baby the mother when they are feeding their baby breast feeding at that time uh, in the village they are gossip together and just covered with this uh, cloth the shari and uh, the hook of the blouse that enter into the eyelid lower eyelid and just take out the lid and what a terrific condition that is three month baby six month baby like that and also there are some intraocular foreign body now it is it is very easy to remove all the intraocular foreign body but at that time there was a giant magnet it was so giant and it was so heavy that it was really impossible for me to push and there are somebody to push it and i only just uh, lowered the magnet part the head part and in this way we have started so this name the appropriate name that war against trauma and this trauma still going on day by day in every part of the world somewhere some in smaller way but in our country in india in pakistan in indonesia and everywhere we are we know that there are so many varieties of stroma and this is a agricultural region and the harvesting time there are trauma due to paddy tree so today's session is such a way they have uh they will uh they will uh present the presenter will present in such a way that is the traumatic retinal detachment very important thing traumatic retinal detachment the younger generation the myopic eye are very much vulnerable for traumatic retinal detachment and also the other also so traumatic retinal detachment will be presented by professor notorajon and uh partho bishwas will present uh traumatic cataract and other thing um professor kader will give presentation on basic corneal injury this is another important corneal injury as because this is the more emergency as soon as it happen as early as repaired by the uh cornea specialist or the uh surgeon that means it will heal very nicely clearly so uh, there will be no edema chances of edema and if it delays then there will be very great um, complication will occur so it is very very ocular trauma is always an emergency and we should deal in that way and i understand i believe that professor sharfuddin and dr noman uh, they will uh, already um, design the session in such a way that everything will be very much helpful for our resident 
for our colleague, for our all uh, the participants, we will be listening. Here are, uh, uh, I am uh, seeing that Professor Deepak is here, uh, Dr. Gita Lisa is here, Dr. Amir, Dr. Uh, Priya, Dr. Partho Pratim and Partho Prishash. All are very great surgeons and wish you a great success. And uh, we will learn from you with this few words. I would like to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to say in front of you. And thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rava, Madam, uh, for your encouraging speech. Uh, now uh, we will start the session. I am requesting Professor Abdul Kader uh, to start uh, his presentation on basic aspects of uh, penetrating corneal injury. So, uh, Professor Abdul Kader, the time is yours. You can start. Uh, good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to be the first soldier in the OIR against trauma. Uh, honorable chairman to the session, panelists, learned speakers, and moderator. Very good evening, everybody. Uh, I like to talk next few minutes basic aspect of penetrating corneal injury. That is, it is a, just a very introductory lecture. Uh, now, what is penetrating corneal injury first? It is, is a partial or full thickness laceration of the cornea by a sharp weapon at the site of impact. It is an ophthalmic emergency. Why it is ophthalmic in emergency? It is, there is a huge impact on eye as well as our life from this injury. The first effect on the eye effects on eye, the ultimate result is corneal scar. Cornea become opaque. The, this reduce corneal transparency. There is cosmetic deformity. And there is alters corneal unique shape. There is a flattening of the cornea leading to hypermetropia as well as astigmatism. And there is uneven corneal surface, hampers the normal resurfacing of the cornea by the tear film and ultimately structural weakness to some extent by the penetrating corneal injury. So what are the general problem by the penetrating corneal injury? There is a loss of vision from mild to moderate to severe loss of vision due to scarring of the cornea. And another important thing is cosmetic deformity. There is an opacity of the cornea leading to cosmetic deformity. This visual loss and cosmetic deformity leading to huge impact on psychological, social, as well as economical impact. So what are the impact in life? There is a huge impact. At first, there is a psychological impact that is always suffering from anxiety. And adaptation to a new and unfavorable reality after the, after the, from the injury of the cornea. And sometimes loss of their job, career opportunities, and sometimes need to the changes of the major career of careers. And there are financial loss, and this, this leads to the altered their lifestyle. And there is increased risk of further injury. And sometimes there is permanent physical deformity. This has the impact on life. And what are the expectations from the patient size? The expectation regain of the good vision as before and attractive beauty as before, as well as expression, he, good expression as before. So what are the our aim in the management of corneal injury? The ultimate aim is spherical cornea with minimal scar. Do not do any harm. That is refractive closure of the eye There are four strategies in the repair of the corneal injury. Any, any type of injury, there are four strategic plans. Number one is prevention of further trauma. By protect the eye with rigid shield in case of open globe injury. And operate 
the injured eye as early as possible. And second important thing is minimize the risk of infection after trauma by introducing broad spectrum antibiotic or antifungal or other antimicrobials and operation as early as possible. This leads to minimize the chance of infection. And third important thing is the psychological trauma. Prevention of psychological trauma by gentle and frank counseling. Counseling is a very much important in the management of injury. And last is the minimize legal problems. Sometimes injury occurred by the homicidal attack or, in, or accidental attack. So proper documentation as well as filling up the medical legal forms for to minimize the legal problems. So what are the, our plan of management? Ways of management, there are four stages. Initial management at the site of injury or in attending the first physician and then counseling, definitive management, and finally the rehabilitation. So what are the initial management? The initial management taking a brief history in short, the time, type, and severity injury and other circumstances. And a specific question must be asked to rule out the foreign bodies, chemical exposure, as well as previous ocular surgery, especially corneal surgery. And visual equity must be measured by the attending physician or attending doctors. Do not flush the injured eye in case of open globe injury. Do not initial any drops or any other things over the eye. And do not rub his eyes. Do not remove the object. Try to remove the object out of the eye and rule out the intraocular foreign body if possible. That the first thing is life threatening condition treat first and the ocular injury. And now what is the therapeutic plan at the site of impact? The reassure the patient, relieve the pain and anxiety as because pain causes squeezing of the eye and expulsion of the intraocular content. So, Pain relief and anxiety is the prime importance at the site of uh, injury. And then uh, to prevent the further injury by protecting the eye shield, eye, by applying the eye shield, not use the patch. Patch causes the pressure over the eye and expulsion of the intraocular content. And sometimes need tetanus prophylaxis as well as to prevent infection, we must use the intravenous antibiotic or oral ciprofloxacin like antibiotics. And we make the plan the patient fasting or not. If it is under general anesthesia, you must pay, pay patient in fasting condition. And referral of the ophthalmologist is the uh, first advice to the patient. To the definitive management. Definitive management done by the ophthal ophthalmologist is at a tertiary eye center. Here the, all the facilities for the repair of the corneal injuries available. A detailed history is taken here and specific question as before. So what I uh, evaluate there an eye, a brief history, and then naked eye examination to see the patient, a severity of the patient. And slit time examination is a must. The direct elimination to see the what type of injuries occurred, what are the extent, what are the circumstances, what are the uh, condition of the injury, what is old or newer, uh, fresh condition. And if there is a question regarding it is AC form or not, then we do the saddle test to confirm. And sometimes we need some investigation like ultrasound, by microscopy, X-ray, CT scan, MRI, base scan, and sometimes we need blood sugar as well as uh, a random blood sugar is some, if there is indicated. And the treatment option, what are the treatment? Are two types of treatment in penetrating corneal injury. Number one is non-surgical treatment, and second is the surgical treatment. Non-surgical treatment are, number one is antibiotic with cycloplegics. If the laceration is not full thickness, it is self-sealing, and then antibiotic and cycloplegic is enough to heal the cornea properly. And second is bandage contact lens, and third is tissue adhesive glue. In case of lamellar laceration, sometimes not full thickness. Uh, if there is full thickness less than two millimeter in size, we can use by it by bandage contact lens. The bandage contact lens should be low water content and stiff fit. Stiff fit for that reason is compact the 
uh, pressure over the cornea to uh, a position, proper a position uh, by the bandage contact lens. This. Another is tissue adhesive. If bandage contact lens is not sufficient, not properly seal the wound, then we use fibrin glue or cyanoacrylate glue. If the perforation is less than two millimeter size or full thickness, and if persistent leaking through this small wound, then we use the uh, tissue adhesive glue. And after uh, application of the tissue adhesive glue, we use the bandage contact lens. And the surgical indication of surgical management. If laceration more than two millimeter is size, and in case of sealed and in any size of uh, injury, displaced wound, loss of corneal tissue, and laceration with iris or lens incarceration, and the wound not amenable to treat with bandage contact lens as well as tissue as well, then we need to repair of the corneal injury. And first important thing is anesthesia. Good anesthesia is mandatory. If anesthesia is not good, eyeball is squeezed and intraocular content will be expelled out. So anesthesia is the very much important beginning of this repair. That the general anesthesia is a good, then if not possible, sometimes we use the perivalvular anesthesia and very few cases topical anesthesia sometimes used. Now, what are the indication of local anesthesia that is possible in by local anesthesia? That is corneal or limbal injury laceration less than five, six millimeter. And in case of form anterior chamber, as well as there is no RFD and very much cooperative patient, then we can use for local anesthesia. And another important thing is exposure of the injured eye. It is very much important. Good anesthesia is mandatory here. We have two procedures by lead, spe lead speculum, another is lead chusa. Very much careful in this stage, as because any undue pressure over the eye uh, leads to the chance of prolapse of intraocular content. This is very, very harmful for the patient. So exposure of the eye, exposure of the injury is very much important. Now there's surgical considerations. There is different types of injury needs, different types of surgery. Number one is full thickness corneal injury. If there is full thickness corneal injury, there is eyeball is flattened. We make it spherical. Why the Rossi and Heiss technique is a very important thing here. That is peripheral suture is larger and deeper than center. In this way, peripheral cornea become flatter and central cornea become uh, stiff. And second important thing is corneoscleral wound. Here, the repair start from the limbus. Limbus is the landmark here. You start initial suturing start at the limbus and then corneal injury repair and then scleral injury. Scleral injury step by step. That is explore and then close as you go like that. And still it wound. It is very much important. There's a two procedure. Have a bridging suture as well as inner suture. And another important thing very much devastating is the tissue loss. If there is corneal injury associated with tissue loss, there is sparse thing suture. We can close the gap and sometimes use the tissue adhesive glue and sometimes we use the pass graft. And that is keratoplasty. And suture materials we use in the corneal uh, uh, ocular injury repair is cornea by 10 or monofilament or 11 or monofilament nylon. And in scleral wound, it is vicryl or polypropylene 8 o and Iris in by pro polypropylene and conjunctiva by Vicryl or 8-0-Cell. And suturing principle. The suturing principle is very much important. It will be perpendicular to the laceration. And 90% depth in each side and equal depth in both sides of injury and length must be 1.5 to 2 millimeter. It depends upon the location and size of the injury. And another important thing is suturing technique. The suturing technique is the not technique is two is to one is to one or three is to one is to one. Three is to one is to more secured, but barring is sometimes but difficult. So all the suture must be buried in, inside the in, 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 cornea. And another important thing after repair of injury is the formation of anterior chamber. 
the first choice is balanced salt solution if balanced salt solution not properly form the anterior chamber then we can try the second choice is air if air is not sufficient then ultimately uh, third choice is gel in the ultimate choice and you must we must form the anterior chamber by the separate paracentesis wound so the basic steps of corneal injury repair is anesthesia exposure of the eyeball and exploration of the wound toileting of the wound reposition of the iris if needed and closure of the wound and formation of the anterior chamber and at last the subconjunctival antibiotic and steroid injection and post operative management is antibiotic steroid control of intraocular pressure and promote the reepithelialization with the artificial tears vitamin c like drugs and suture removal in case of uh, adult it is 3 months onwards in children 1 to 2 months within 1 to 2 months and infant it is earlier within few weeks of after repair of the corneal injury and in sometimes there is needed early repair, early removal of the sutures like loose sutures in suture abscess corneal ulcer and in case of vascularization vascularization indicate the healing of the wound and the fundamental role of injury repair is if you cannot you do not do and the ultimately is visual rehabilitation by spectacle lens if spectacle lens is not sufficient there is irregular astigmatism we can try the rgb contact lens and then astigmatic keratotomy uh, sometimes need, needs laser surgeries and ultimately uh, if there is a uh, big uh, opacity large opacities then we do the keratoplasty so ultimately there is no proven recipe for corneal injury repair of uh, ocular injury repair so every ophthalmologist must be an from an expert so this is my very very basic aspect of uh, corneal injury repair uh, thank you very much for patient sharing good night thank you professor abdul qadir for your nice presentation uh, i am requesting all the speakers to take care of their times um uh, can you please stop your sharing yes yes yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, shams mohammad noman we yes, welcome uh, dr partho bishay he has already joined with us uh, uh, even though he has already uh, told us that even though he is late i think it is uh, late uh, it is better late than never Parto Bishas, it is okay. Hello. Yes, Hello. welcome. Welcome. Is <laughs> there a late find, sir? Is there a late find or a late penalty? Yes, yes. The <laughs> no. find will be Thank taken you. from India in the next twenty-one. <laughs> oh, okay. I think. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, also Parto Bishas. Thank you for coming. Uh, you. I think uh, uh, now uh, we can discuss on these uh, matters: the corneal injury, basic aspects of corneal injury. So I'm requesting uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Sina to uh, tell uh, some comments about this speech or presentation. Uh, a very good evening to all of you, and thank you, Dr. Norman, for including me in this webinar. And before I start the, uh, you know, my comments on this uh, wonderful talk that Professor Kadir has given, um, I would like to, uh, you know, pay my regards to uh, Professor Abbas and Ma'am. and professor fudin sir they are the pillars uh, of ophthalmology not only in bangladesh but uh, all over the south countries and asia pacific so thanks to all of you uh, i think it was a very nicely uh, covered presentation by professor kadir and i will be very crisp and short in just adding a few points that uh, i felt that uh, you know what i can uh, and i will just go on the basic principle that professor kadir had told and that was uh, minimize scarring and that is very essential and for minimizing scarring it is very essential to have a proper edge to edge apposition because if the edges are not apposed properly the scar the scar sky size will increase that is one the second point is that we should try to avoid getting that part vascularized and that at least in the central part and that vascularization increases the thickness of the scar so in order to reduce vascularization one should be absolutely careful that there is no iris tissue adhesion to the to the uh, to the uh, wound so that should be released 
Third thing, uh, Professor Kadir had very nicely mentioned, avoid infection. And that infection also increases vascularization. So one should be very careful. And for preventing infection, one, there are two major things. One is that if you, uh, if the uh, sutures are loose, then they can incite vascularization and that can come from periphery and then come in the center and that can create problems. The second thing is that uh, if uh, if there is any leak in the wound, that is that will create, that can cause infection. Then of course, psych Sir had told psychological trauma. Yes, yes, that is very much there. So we should prevent that by counseling, Sir had told. The second thing is appropriate management and it is an ophthalmic emergency. So we have to be very fast in our actions so that we can uh, minimize damage. And uh, one thing I would just uh, uh, like uh, interior chamber maintenance, uh, sir had mentioned, I will just differ on that, that I would not use viscoelastic, any gel substance for maintaining because the, the uh, there's risk of increase in IOP post-op. So we should avoid doing that. And uh, another thing that uh, Sarah had mentioned that uh, this uh, is seen many times in children. And sometimes these children are in the embryopogenic age group. So once again, a proper visual rehabilitation is something which is very, very important. And that proper visual rehabilitation, if the scar is coming bang in the center, then many times RGP contact lens, we also had a study done at RB Center, RGP contact lens in these, these traumatic scars, they help quite a lot and they improve visual acuity. So I'll, I'll just, I just wanted to add these points to uh, you know, the presentation. Otherwise, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ajisthina, for your um, excellent deliberation. And I think some important uh, notes, I think this is very much important for the residents. All this, um, and, uh, uh, do you want to share anything uh, within the panelists or even for, uh, from the speakers? Uh, I then, will say uh, to Professor Kader, he has nicely mentioned, uh, one uh, of the students probably asked you that uh, why you have told that nothing to be removed from the eyeball after the injury. Probably they wanted to know that uh, you have uh, mentioned that you will not touch as you are not the cornea specialist, you should send it or refer it to ophthalmologist. But what is your view on this uh, uh, question? Kadeh. Thank you very much for a nice question. Uh, if we can, uh, if in in periphery and that in attending physician who is not the, uh, there is no uh, proper uh, instrument or other things to manage this. So if we re remove this, foreign body, there is an open globe injury open and intraocular contest become, uh, uh, comes out through this uh, wound. For that reason, yeah. we cannot do, uh, try to remove this. And sometimes there is uh, iris can uh, uh, just uh, out and this can be removed with the yeah. whole, that is from uh, iatrogenic iris, uh, removal of the iris. For that reason, we not uh, advise to remove this uh, in these sub centers. Okay. Sometimes so we have seen in our practicing at the time that uh, the uh, uh, ophthalmologist, there is no ophthalmologist, medical officer in the Upojela. They have got one injury of the eye and they are, try to clean it and then they are giving the pressure with the um, patches. Then it will uh, create some problem that there will be iris uh, uh, prolapse as well as the intraocular <laughs> content may come out. So they should not give anything, they will just refer it. They should know how to refer and whom to refer. This should be their attitude. Fine. So have, Thank you, uh, Norman. Next. I have, one, uh, I have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, what should be very much important after Irish prolapse? The, the time or the color? If you, uh, about the reposition of the iris, what is the consideration? The time or the color of the iris? Uh, um, bo both are important. Both are important. Time, if the, the time relapse, there is the epithelialization. So time as well as color. Color, dip, color indicates that what is it is viable or not. If there is not viable, it will be excised. And if viable, it will be reposited. So what is your uh, comment on this, uh, 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 Dr. Parthavishwa, sir? Do you have any <clears throat> comment? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me in this webinar. And it's a pleasure to be in Bangladesh day after day uh, day before <laughs> yesterday and yesterday we were all ready to be here and uh, 
Thanks yeah. for uh, these wonderful webinars that you are having. My regards to Professor Ava Hussain, ma'am, and uh, Professor Shafuddin, and uh, every one of you who are here. Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, iris is definitely a structure that, if the viability is retained, then only it be retained. If the viability is not there, then it best be excised and taken off, and an iris repair be done. So as it would be a case-to-case -case basis, and especially if it is a long-standing uh, wound with the iris prolapse, the epithelization over the iris structure would have happened. And in such a case, this iris is not viable. Their abscission of the iris and then repair, and if whatever can be done to repair the iris internally should be done, suturing. And if at all the iris becomes uh, such that it cannot be repaired, then of course we have the aniridia rings and uh, they can definitely be a proposition in such cases. Just one thing I would like okay. to add here yes. is that if, yes. if the iris prolapse is too big and there is, you know, it is of long duration, in that case, what we have done and uh, is that uh, you may not have to excise the complete iris if you dissect then you may be able to dissect the superficial layer kind of thing from iris and you will see a thin layer behind and you can leave that. So if it's a large tissue, then you can do that and it works quite well. And uh, intracameral uh, antibiotics in such cases is mandatory. Thank right. you. Thank Rajesh you. Is right. yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sina, for your comment. Now our next speaker, um, uh, uh, Dr. Partho Patim, Dr. Dr. Yes. Yes. Next. Next speaker. Yes. Go on. Yes. Dr. Um, uh, Partho Patim, Dr. Mojumdar. I'm requesting Dr. Partho Patim, Dr. Mojumdar uh, to start his presentation. Uh, his topic is traumatic uveitis. Uh, Dr. Partho Patim, Mojumdar, the time is yours. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Norman. Uh, first of all, thanks to OSWB for, uh, sorry, OSB for giving me this uh, opportunity. And uh, my regards to uh, Avahoshan, ma'am, and uh, Sarfuddin, sir. See, uh, it's glad to see you all after a long time. So I'll be talking on traumatic uveitis. So uh, ocular injury, as we know, that can lead to significant changes in one individual's life in terms of morbidity and the quality of life. So although eyes represent only 0.3% of a person's total body surface area, the loss of one eye leads to approximately 24% of the whole person impairment, whereas the loss of both eyes can lead to 85% of the disability. So having said this, I'll, I'll just discuss the five, uh, 10 aspects of the traumatic uveitis today. The first, uh, uh, first uh, tenet one should know is how to, you have to, if you see a case of traumatic uveitis, you have to evaluate what type of trauma it is, whether it's a blunt trauma or whether it's a, it, uh, due to some chemical injury or the spillage of some hot water. So you have to understand that what kind of trauma it is, whether it, this trauma has led to any iris incarceration or any other uh, mechanical damage to the eye. So first important is to, make uh, sure that what kind of trauma you are dealing with. For that, you need to take an extensive hist history. The second point is, it's very important to uh, understand that what is the primary site of the inflammation, whether the inflammation is localized in the anterior chamber, or whether the primary site of the inflammation is vitreous, or it has affected the retina or choroid. So usually in ocular trauma, the vitreous is rarely uh, inflamed, and the most commonly the... Uh, inflammation is located to anterior chamber. So iridocyclitis can develop even after non-penetrating uh, non and uh, trivial trauma also. And the reported cases of traumatic iridocyclitis range from 0.4% to 50%. In children, it's very important to rule out traumatic uveitis because many a time patient presents with anterior uveitis and one has to differentiate it from the cases of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So the third important point is rule out the other causes of anterior uveitis. Many a time, 
as we know by definition, traumatic uveitis is typically unilateral. So one has to evaluate and rule out the other causes of uh, other causes of unilateral uveitis. This includes HLA associated uveitis, viral anterior uveitis, and Fuchs uveitis. So HLA B27 uveitis can be easily ruled out because it keeps alternating between the eyes. So if you take a detailed history, the patient will tell, tell you about the re, uh, recurrent attack or the previous attack. The viral anterior uveitis often it's uh, thought to be manifested by the trauma. The, any any kind of trauma can precipitate uh, the on, uh, precipitate the viral uveitis. So one need to carefully examine the cornea whether there is any scarring, any other kind of KPs you have to note. Fuchs uveitis is often seen and present as unilateral and often we, we encounter the patients who, who, who will come to your OPD and will give a history of subtle traumas, trivial trauma and on examination a total cataract was found and they will attribute it to the trauma. But whereas if you look carefully the iris details, you can easily make out that it's a kind of trauma, uh, it's not due to trauma, it can be, it is due to Fuchs uveitis. Fourth point, very important, is always do gonioscopy and IOP measurement. It is very important because you can miss angle recession and following a closed uh, trauma, IOP measurement is very important. Particularly, I have seen many a time the children, in, ch in case of children, many people, they don't take the IOP uh, uh, and uh, angle recession, glaucoma and other things should be uh, ruled out in such cases. Now, another important is you have to uh, think uh, twice before you level it as an inflammation in the vitreous in a traumatic uveitis. Though trauma is, uh, you have to remember that the trauma is leading causes of vitreous hemorrhage in young people. And the small vitreous hemorrhage can often perceived as a multiple floaters and often can be ignored. So one should avoid the diagnostic confusion between the vitreous hemorrhage and the vitreous, uh, vitreous inflammation. So if for that, you need to examine the patient closely, and one should rule out uh, rule out the uh, rule out the cells and uh, hemorrhages. For example, if you uh, pass a narrow beam, uh, slit lamp beam, you can see here the inflammatory cells will appear relatively large in size, and as you can see in this diagram, the interparticle distance between them will be uh, more. I'm sorry for the, uh, the typo here. The interparticle distance will be more. Whereas in vitreous hemorrhage, if you see here, the, the, the these will be bar, uh, brown to uh, dark brown in color and the interparticle distance them will be very less. They'll be densely organized. So this is a one way of differentiating between the inflammatory cells and the heme. So the sixth important point is always rule out traumatic endophthalmitis. As I said that the vitreous inflammation is very less. So if you see cases like cases with presence of intraocular foreign body, high uh, history of uh, penetrating injury in the affected eye, and vitreitis uh, with or without clumps of deb uh, debris, and the presence of hypopion, you should rule out traumatic uveitis. The seventh point is explain all the patients about the signs and symptoms of sympathetic ophthalmitis. It is very important to explain the signs and symptoms because they may experience it and you can prevent the loss of vision in other eye also. Because the early treatment of sympathetic ophthalmia has a very favorable outcome. So you have to explain the uh, patient about the redness, watering or any uh, onset of ocular pain. And one important thing you can ask your, uh, explain to your patient that difficulty re to read and do near work is often the first symptoms of sympathetic ophthalmitis. Because of the inflammation of the ciliary body, often the, the near work difficulty is the earliest sign of sympathetic ophthal ophthalmia. So you can explain these signs to your patients with penetrating injury. So I'll just go a uh, little bit about the symptoms sympathetic ophthalmia. So sympathetic ophthalmia, as you know, it's a bilateral diffuse granulomatous panuviatis, which can occur any, uh, any planned or unplanned injury with uveal tract uh, or the iris incarceration. 
Now I'll just show another case which was managed uh, in Bangladesh, and uh, ultimately we achieved a very good su uh, success rate, and it was very unique. So a 35-year-old female from Bangladesh who presented with pain painless and progressive loss of vision in right eye, and there was history of accidental burn with the hot water to the left side of her face involving the left eye nine months back, as you can see here. So we have taken the necessary permission from the patient to show the photograph. So she lost her vision in the left eye and denied any history of other surgical intervention to the eye. So, so now you can imagine when it's such patient presents with inflammation in other eye, the good eye. So we usually level it as a inciting eye. The inciting eye is that eye which has suffered the trauma and the sympathizing eye, which is the normal and which is reflect, re reacting to the inflammation, uh, infl inflammation due to the antigen exposure in the inciting eye. So the patient presented with 660 vision in the right eye. And if you can see the fundus, you can clearly make out that the, there was a lot of SRF pocket, which is more evident in the ultra, ultrasound uh, B scan. And there was also uh, cells uh, 2 plus in the anterior chamber and plenty of cells in the anterior vitreous. So she was administered three doses of intravenous methylprednisolone followed by oral azathioprine 50 mg thrice a day. And on follow-up visit, you see her vision improved to 6-6 with resolution of the exudative uh, retinal detachment. So when to suspect a sympathetic ophthalmia, it should be considered in case of any uveitis which, which is occurring after any ocul ocular insert. So it may not be a penetrating injury, it can be a scald, it can be any kind of chemical injury which has led to the uveal tract incarceration. So number eight point is OCT can be a very useful tool and it can help in identifying the early manifestation of the sympathetic ophthalmia in patients with suggestive history. So if you always perform uh, in, uh, OCT in a symptomatic patient with history or suggestive history and look for the serous retinal detachment, disruption of the eyes waist junction and hyperreflective lesions at the RP, RP which can be due to the uh, uh, nodule and also look for the non increase choroidal thickness. But you must remember that all these are very non-specific signs and it can be seen in many other conditions. So proper evaluation of all this uveitic entity is very important. So number nine is it you, you should do in presence of SRF in the posterior pool, you should do fundus fluorescent angiography because many of the time these patients are very young and apprehensive. So before starting aggressive therapy in this young patients, thinking it as a sympathetic ophthalmia, I think you should do a FFA and see the, see the fundus fluorescent angiogram properly. For example, if you see this patient was a, a the other eye suffered a penetrating, uh, penetrating injury and the patient presented with a uh, subretinal fluid in the posterior pole. So my resident was uh, suspecting sympathetic ophthalmia and when we uh, investigated with the fundus fluorescent angiography, you can see here the classical smokestack uh, appearance. So it was a case of CSR, not sympathetic ophthalmia. So the last point is the treat aggressively. For our purpose, we have to remember that sympathetic ophthalmia is a condition that could result in bilateral vision loss or significant ocular morbidity if we don't treat them aggressively or rapidly. So always hit the inflammation hard, use oral steroid should be used enough, soon enough, and long enough. When, once, you have, uh, once you are sure about the diagnosis, don't delay the treatment. Use enough dose of oral steroid. Often we see treating a sympathetic ophthalmia with suboptimal dose of oral steroid like 20 mg or 30 mg, which uh, creates complication. And uh, it's very difficult to treat those patients later. And one should taper the steroid properly, weekly, not every three, four days and follow them up very closely and monitor the clinical response and systemic symptoms. So here is the just flowchart to summarize the treatment of sympathetic ophthalmia. Like on, in normal cases, you should uh, treat, a, treat a case of sympathetic ophthalmia with uh, topical steroid and cycloplegic for the anterior chamber reaction and high dose of oral steroid too if there is any posterior segment involvement. If the patient presents with this three, three uh, pattern, like exudative RD, optic nerve involvement or involvement of the macula, then one should go for the pulse, uh, pulse corticosteroid or IV, uh, 
methylprednisolone. And similarly, if the patient is resistant to steroid, having recurrent attack of the inflammation in the same eye, then one should think of immunosuppressive agents. Just to conclude my 10 points on traumatic uveitis, the detailed history to elaborate the type and nature of the trauma is essential. Always try to classify the uveitis before you start treating them. Rule out the other causes of unilateral anterior uveitis before you uh, start the treatment. Make sure it's the inflammation in the vitreous, not vitreous hemorrhage. Gonioscopy and IOP measurement is must in a case of traumatic uveitis or rather in all cases of trauma. Six, beware of traumatic endophthalmitis. Don't mistake it as a pan uveitis and treat them with oral steroid. Explain about the sympathetic ophthalmia to all cases of penetrating injury while discharging the patient. OCT can pick up very early changes, so don't forget to order one OCT in symptomatic patients with suggestive history. Always perform fundus fluorescent angiography to rule out the associate, associate, uh, associated uh, central serous retinopathy. And always treat a case of sympathetic ophthalmia very aggressively. Thank you. Noman, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Patupatim, uh, uh, for your excellent deliberation. I think uh, we'll go for the, the discussion. Noman, unmute yourself and then uh, invite. Noman. Yes, yes, I'm here. No problem. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Patupatim Mojumda, for your excellent and informative presentation. Uh, now it's the time um, for the discussion. Uh, I'm requesting uh, Dr. Amir uh, uh, to tell about uh, something about uh, about the traumatic uveitis, and then uh, I'm requesting uh, Professor Deepak Nath to comment on this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nawan, for your kind intuition, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. And a very nice talk by Dr. Majmudar. I think he he has explained most of the points which we need to remember. I would just highlight a few things. Uh, one thing, as he mentioned about examination is very important. I think especially in the children, uh, it may not be easy to examine. Even the history-wise, children are not going to give you appropriate history. And sometimes what happens, the adults may not be accompanying there. So you have to be really good in examining the children. And other problem, endothelmitis, we do get in children commonly. If they have any injury, even if they are giving a history of non-penetrating injury, you may expect that they, they would have some penetration, but thing may not be lying within the eye and they will have the end of the mic. So you need to investigate, do B scan, uh, carefully look the anterior chamber, look for hyperpion, it may be smaller. And I think coming to the sympathetic of the mitis, uh, I think it's very important that if the, there is no vision in the eye and injury is so severe that drop repair may not be properly done, it's important to discuss about early evisceration. Uh, because risk of sympathetic ophthalmitis, we know that it starts within a few days and keep on going up to many, many years. Uh, there are cases reported after uh, like 30, 40 years. And uh, uh, other important thing I would like to mention that steroids, yes, initially, uh, it's very important to use them. But most of these sympathetic ophthalmitis patients, they would require steroid sparing agents. And that you need to keep on using for a longer duration. You, keep, you need to keep monitoring your patients properly and uh, that would really help. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amir Awan, for your uh, tips and comments. Uh, now I'm requesting uh, Professor Deepak Nath. Do you have any comments on traumatic uveitis? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Patrapati Majumdar. It's a nice presentation, indeed. Uh, I have just two points. Uh, uh, one, one is, uh, I think uh, uh, once there is a trauma and uh, vision does not correspond with it, the traumatic, uh, I mean, the ocular conditions. Uh, OCT is also important to look. Uh, sometimes, you know, traumatic uh, cystoid macular edema or macular edema can be there. Even there is no vitreous memory. So, uh, so if there is a vision discrepancy between the traumatic uveitis and, and, and uh, vision, then OCT can help you to identify there is macular or not, number one. And number two is um, sympathetic ophthalmitis. Actually, when we were a student, it was, uh, I mean, uh, we got lots of patients uh, came with a sympathetic ophthalmitis. 
nowadays steroid new oral steroid uh, 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 has reduced the number of sympathetic optometries uh, significantly so i think uh, if there is a trauma and if there is traumatic uveitis we should start a systemic steroid and uh, and and that may that may reduce the incidence of sympathetic optometries in future uh thank you very much thank you thank you uh, uh professor natrajan do you want to say anything uh, unmute yourself natrajan yes hey uh numan yes, yes sir yes sir no, no. yes right. natrajan yes you continue uh, no 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 what is it uh, what did you ask me to do shams <laughs> yes, I'm telling about the traumatic uveitis. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, 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 this? Sympathetic ophthalmia is a form of uh, bilateral uh, uveitis. Right. So I, when you do a primary wound repair, you have to make sure no intraocular content is incarcerated in the hmm. wound repair so that you don't have that retinal S antigen release. So yeah, I think, uh, I hope uh, our partner will uh, agree with that. Yes. I will ask one question to uh, Natarajan and uh, also Amit. What are the incidences of sympathetic ophthalmia in your country? As because in our country, uh, I think the incidence is not much more. How you have uh, calculated and how many patients you get there in sympathetic ophthalmitis due to traumatic event? Patrick, can also say yes. Patrick, have you got any? Yeah, yeah, the the latest trend is we are observing uh, sympathetic ophthalmia more with uh, surgeries, especially yes. the multiple vitreal uh, vitreous surgery, vitreoretinal surgery is uh, one of the risk factor, and yes. uh, the, why we are uh, seeing encountering less uh, sympathetic ophthalmia with ocular trauma is maybe the ocular trauma itself is coming down, because yes. this many country the safety gear uh, they are using safety glasses they are using. So the ocular trauma may be coming down. So that's why we are seeing less number of. Yes. Amir Khan. Uh, yeah. Amir Awan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think in uh, Pakistan, if I look at my practice, I, I think I'm seeing one or two patients every year. So still, I do see the patients, and uh, I've got quite a few number of patients whom I'm managing uh, with sympathetic ophthalmitis. So what about in the Indonesia, uh, Dr. Yeah. Gitalisa? Gitalisa can thank give you. some comment. Thank you. So when I was still uh, in my residency, I see more cases of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. Even by then, uh, the numbers were not great. Maybe um, mm -hmm. one or two cases during my residency. So uh, I think we're quite lucky. Uh, and nowadays, I think it's even more rare. Yeah? So, so I don't. Maybe since the last three or four years, I only have seen one case. And um, well, I think uh, that's because I think I agree with uh, Prof. Deepak. Uh, many trauma cases in my center in the university hospital uh, are given uh, whenever we cannot view the posterior segment, we give systemic uh, or oral uh, steroids. So I think that also helps uh, reduce the inflammation and hopefully will help the fellow eye. I have the observation with this that three things. Uh, has uh, reduced the sympathetic ophthalmia. One, uh, maybe the less ocular trauma. Another one, use of uh, uh, steroid and uh, protection of the eyes uh, than previous. That may be the cause of less sympathetic ophthalmia. Lot of interest. Ocular trauma, how, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, ma'am. Less ocular trauma means, uh, Shafuddin? I was telling that uh, previously, the ocular trauma was much more. Nowadays, due to precaution, and the patients are also aware of, that's why due to protection as well as, you see, in our country, we are telling all the farmers, you will use the goggles during uh, farming. So this is also one of the protection to the eye. In this way, I think uh, the uh, injury is less. That's why sympathetic ophthalmia is no, uh, uh, less. Uh, Penetrating injury is not that much less. There are so many penetrating injury are coming now. That's because uh, uh, in uh, National Institute, in Dhaka Medical College, there are um, always uh, penetrating yes, injury is coming. Uh, yes. But yes. Uh, 
agricultural injury, I agree with you fully that uh, due to awareness development and they are using goggles due to during harvesting season. So that uh, thing are listening loud. And I, I was, have a question to Partho Protein, please. Yes, ma'am. I have a question yes. to Partho Protein. Uh, you have said very nicely one thing that every patient of penetrating corneal injury, uh, you are explaining the uh, sympathetic ophthalmia, sympathetic ophthalmitis uh, to the patient. What uh, you want to say to the patient, uh, what they will look for or what they will do? No, you, what you explanation just, you want? Yeah, just explain the patient that if you develop redness, watering, ocular pain in the right. other eye, you have to uh, come, come eye. for an ocular consultation. Awareness, yes. I Very think important Rajasin, thing. Yes. Uh, I think Rajasina, sir. To, yes. Rajasina. Yeah. I just want. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I think uh, uh, Avam also told that you know even now because of so many other factors we get we also get because since may, maybe we have uh, the this is our our center is the referral center. So we get a lot of cases of uh, traumatic injuries and all that. I One thing I feel that probably we have better quality microscopes Management. available these days. Correct. And Management. the repair is better and the yes. uveal incarceration is less, less after the repair. So that is that, perhaps one that reason. Is the People who are yes. working on loops, they are having some microscopes which are obviously less costly, but still they can afford microscopes. Those who had the lesser quality microscopes, they are having better quality microscopes. I guess that has improved things quite a lot. Yes. Thank you. Logic Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajasthina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Quality of management is improved. Next. That is the main Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm requesting Dr. Tarik Rajali for his quick comments. A lot of interest uh, over these uh, uh, topics and a lot of yes. residencies are asking questions. So, uh, quick comments from uh, Dr. Tarik Rajali. And Tarik Rajali, Partho Pratim will also say something. Uh, Partho Bishash will also say something. Yes. Dr. Partho Pratim, actually, uh, he has created a very beautiful history. Here. Can, can we speak loudly, sir? Yeah, uh, Dr. Partho, uh, I'm just... I want to add one thing that during examination, uh, actually we have to think of indirect ophthalmoscopy, bilateral indirect ophthalmoscopy, you can't ignore that. That is very much important. Say if you find that some, usually by blunt, you will find anterior uveitis or iridocyclitis, but you have to search in the vitreous, in the retina also, what are the trauma is there. <coughs> one thing I want to add. Another thing for, uh, Dr. Amir was telling that for the children, Actually, we have to go for examination under anesthesia. That is very much important to rule out any other trauma, any other thing. And uh, lastly, actually, I want to ask Dr. Partha, uh, Partha Pratim Dr. Majumda, what actually, what is the pathogenesis? What is the pathogenesis of traumatic uveitis? Can you tell us? Partha Pratim Majumda? Yeah. So, so pathogenesis of if you uh, if you ask me the pathogenesis of sympathetic ophthalmia, ophthalmia then it is the correct the typical uh, exam exam I, example. I think actually uh, traumatic anterior uveitis. Hmm. Why does it occur? So it, there is no clear cut cause for that, but most probable there's some me mechanical injury uh, which causes the the breach in the barrier of blood uh, aqueous yes. barrier and the iris starts leaking uh, the protein and exudates into the anterior chamber. So that is the most possible explanation for that. Yeah. Are the after you. effects of Thank the concussion? Yeah. yeah. Priya. Yeah. No, I just said that they are just the after effects of the concussion of the injury because yeah. these are usually blunt traumas blunt trauma. which yes, give rise yes. to such kind of things. So it's, it's always a repercussion which is coming up. Maybe you don't know whether the angle is involved or uh, which structure is actually involved. Uh, many times we uh, happen to see, we don't see anything in the immediate period. We might see it maybe after a few days or maybe after a few weeks. So it's always the manifestation which comes up, not exactly an exact cause. It depends on which structure is damaged at that point of time. Dr. Partho Bishash, will you uh, want to say something? Uh, yes, sir. Uh Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so, just wanted to um, say the same thing. Uh, well, uh, the incidence of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia has definitely gone down over what was taught in our textbooks when we were residents. And now, the figures are somewhere near 
0.03 per a lakh of uh, patients which have been examined. Uh, this is from a, a study that in Northern India. And uh, however, that there is also evidence that in children, the sympathetic ophthalmia numbers are more as compared to the adults. So that is a very important uh, fact. And I think this uh, uh, should be borne in mind when examining a child and a follow-up examination, aggressive treatment, and a long follow-up examination regularly should be done for especially children and uh, obviously for adults also, but with special notice to this uh, aspect. Thank you. Thank Come you, uh, Professor Parthu Vishash, uh, for your comments. Now uh, we are coming to our uh, third speaker. Uh, I'm requesting Dr. Priya Naran uh, to tell uh, his start his, her presentation on traumatic Irish repair. Uh, Dr. Priya Naran, you can start your presentation. Time is yours. Yeah. Is this seen? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So at the outset, I would like to begin my talk by thanking Dr. Shams Naman for giving me this wonderful opportunity and also to uh, Professor Rava and uh, Professor Shafruddin. I'm uh, really very glad to be here in front of um, uh, such a beautiful uh, uh, group of uh, doctors and uh, panelists and uh, the audience. So uh, thank you so much for having me here. So, well, I have been asked to cover up the traumatic iris repair. So I would just uh, go ahead with the uh, various things that actually, you know, whenever you have an iris damage, so uh, the, uh, the, the points that come forward in your mind are that you need to reconstruct the pupil. Uh, first is aligning the pupil center, and then you need to have uh, an iris based reconstruction. You also need uh, multiple surgical approaches and techniques, uh, which you might need to uh, have a perfect uh, kind of pupil that you really want. And then comes the artificial iris, where uh, probably when not, you can not do anything and maybe the entire iris is damaged. So uh, there are various aspects of treatment of iris repair uh, in the case. So I'll just go ahead, I'll first show, now this is what I'm going to show it today is just the surgical method of how to go ahead with the things. And I'll be just trying to show a few methods of reconstructing the center of the pupil and also the base of the iris tissue. And I think maybe the audience and the uh, uh, residents, they can understand this and for the benefit of their patients. So the first thing I'm just trying to show you is a single pass for the plastic procedure. This is the uh, animation. Uh, you can see here, we need to reconstruct uh, a part of the iris tissue and also the pupil. So what is being done here is that you have this uh, a 10 or a 9 needle, which comes up from this side, and then you introduce uh, through the paracentesis uh, uh, the needle, 26 gauge needle, which uh, railroads the method. And then you just pull this loop of uh, uh, suture and the suture end is passed to this four times in the similar direction. And that is why, uh, how it, this technique derives its name, the fourth row, and then you just cut it off. You don't have to take another pass with this. And this is actually very helpful in cases of traumatic uh, cases because already you are having an iris pigment dispersion in the eye and everything. So with one single pass, at least one area can be done uh, as compared to other methods where you at least need two or three passes to be done. So I think this is just a, uh, an animation which I just tried to describe you. This is the technique which was described by me in the European Journal about three to four years back. So have a, uh, this is a first clinical case. I'll, I'll be, the severity of the iris will keep on increasing as the video keeps on coming. So this is just a small iris defect that you are seeing initially and you just need to reconstruct this. So when you have a localized uh, sectoral involvement of the iris tissue, then it's just a simple pupiloplasty procedure uh, which helps you to reconstruct this. So what you actually do into this is you need to have paracentesis incisions that you had it here and you had this uh, nino sutured straight needle passing through the proximal iris. And then from another paracentesis, you introduce another needle and you railroad this and you pull this out. And then from the, uh, with the help of this loop or whatever you have uh, the uh, device uh, in your uh, uh, center, you can pull off this loop from one of the paracentesis and the suture end, which was lying on that side, uh, you just need to take uh, four throws. They are being taken in the same direction. They cannot go in the opposite direction. You have to take in any one direction. In that direction, you have to go through that four times and you just pull it. 
this creates a self locking mechanism it has a self locking so you do not have to take a, a second pass for the same thing you just have to take an intraocular scissors and you just cut this off and you are done so actually this repair procedure keeps on going on till you are comfortable and you have finished off doing the entire area now you have this much space which is left out so you need to do this procedure again it's a very simple procedure i think everybody can uh, go ahead and do it in their uh, clinical practice and try to achieve uh, the kind of pupil that you actually require and you want it for your specific case you can do it with viscoloscopy you can do it with fluid infusion the choice is yours it also depends upon the case uh, what kind of case you are having and uh, based on that you need to have a good tonicity in the eye which you can have with whatever you desire and you just close up this so this was just for the center of the pupil i go up with one more severe thing now this is a case uh, which had come to me uh, this was uh, a corneal tear repair was done by the referring surgeon so now what you see here is the corneal opacity the sutures have been removed the patient had cataract i have actually i was asked to talk about iris repair so i have edited my secondary eye oil fixation this patient had a subluxated lens which was also uh, present and i have done a secondary eye oil fixation with the glued eye procedure you can also see the flaps uh, on both the sides so i have I, i have done with this now what you see is that i also need to reconstruct the pupil here but my visibility is very poor in this case so what i actually try to do is because i need to construct the pupil uh, in the superior and in the nasal area but visibility is almost zero so what i try to do i do i try to do this things uh, in a different way uh, in this case because you know at times i try to use the oblique illumination etc to help me see from this area because i know i need to pass my suture from somewhere here and it should come out but i'm not actually sure of how much amount of iris tissue is there now uh, what has happened is that i have just created the parasynthesis so something just strikes me and what i try to do is that you know uh, i try to pull the iris tissue from here to here i try to reconstruct the pupil i know this is going to block the entire center of the pupil but i'm trying to do this because i know that when i do this uh, whatever amount of iris tissue which is probably lying behind this scar will also be pulled along with it and it will come into the center and then i can uh, 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 undo the thing which i have, which i am doing right now so i'm trying to do a single pass photocopuloplastic procedure again in this area and um, you can see the similar procedure i have repeated i have taken up the hook and the suture loop has been withdrawn and i'm just going to uh, take up the four throws and do the pupiloplasty procedure here this is just the um, uh, four throws which are being taken i have just fast forwarded this video uh, so that you know uh, i can show you the entire thing so now having done this once i pull this i know this entire iris tissue has come up now i am doing this procedure only with the help of my tactile sensations because i am not seeing anything be beneath this scar but i am damn sure with my tactile sensation that with this end opening forceps i have hold the iris tissue beneath it so i have passed it from the proximal iris tissue i am coming up from the distal iris tissue and you can see uh, in these traumatic cases the iris tissue open you know uh, they are very fragile even a nano needle is creating such a big hole in this iris tissue you can just have a look at this uh, it's it's just a small needle which has passed through it and there's a big hole out there that means the iris tissue is Uh, probably very fragile and it has gone through a lot of trauma so now what i'm trying to do here is that i'm trying to do the similar procedure of single pass four throw in this and i know my iris tissue i can see a bit from here which is being pulled off and i do the similar procedure and then try to reconstruct the pupil now you will say that madam you have just closed up the pupillary area so what uh, extra thing are you going to do i think uh, maybe i might just fast forward this a bit so i'm just cutting off the suture ends here and what then i do differently is i take up the vitrectomy probe because now i need to cut off this iris tissue which was present out here anyway uh, so with the vitrectomy probe i try to fashion up the pupil so that there is an area from where the uh, uh, the uh, source of light is there for this eye and definitely this patient is going to undergo a penetrating keratoplasty in future but at this moment when i am i have done a secondary eye fixation i have reconstructed the pupil now what is going to happen is that at a later stage when the uh, penetrating keratoplasty will be done for this case at least there is an iris uh, tissue barrier uh, which holds on and it uh, there is a full compartmentalization of the eye as an anterior uh, chamber and as a posterior chamber and that pro probably increases the chances of graft survival in the next surgery which will be done for the cornea 
But anyway, this patient was very happy. The patient had a 660 vision, not much. 660 was quite good because when the patient came, hardly had any counting finger kind of thing uh, in this case. So anyway, this is uh, one of the things that I just wanted to show that many a times, you know, in these cases, we do face some challenging things. Okay, I'll just try to show, this is again a traumatic iridodialysis. And you can see that the patient also has a cataract. The patient also has an iridodialysis out here. So this is one of the techniques which I'm uh, just uh, going to show you how to reconstruct the, uh, uh, the um, peripheral iridodialysis. This is actually by Dr. Mami Kusaka and all they had presented in the ACRS last year and this video, this method had one. So I just picked up this idea from there. These are the Japanese doctors. So what uh, initially what I'm trying to do in this case is you know, just doing a cataract extraction, removing the nucleus and figure emulsification, putting up an intraocular lens and all that things, which is uh, commonly done by everybody. Uh, secondly, what uh, this iridodialysis is not very big. It's it's uh, it's uh, it can be easily managed. So what I'm trying to do in this uh, with this method is that this is a six o polypropylene suture which is cut down into pieces of about six to seven centimeters, and we take up this um, this uh, hot cautery, uh, the and we're trying to create a flange. This something like a Yamane method where we try to do it for the intraocular lens. So a flange is being created, and then you just press it with the uh, needle holder and that uh, increases the diameter of the flange. Now this flange is going to hold the periphery of the iris tissue in this method. So what we actually do is that ar around the area of the iridodialysis, we try to uh, make a scleral groove. And from the scleral groove, this is a 30 gauge needle which is going on. It goes on into the uh, uh, iridodialysis at the base of the iris from where you want to uh, pull this off into the periphery. And the suture which was flanged is then passed through this. So it is just threaded into the barrel of this needle. You can just see it is being put inside and then you just pull the needle. So what happens along with this is that it will just pull the six of proline suture along with it. And this flange, which was created initially is going to hold it over. So that is why this technique is known as a double flange technique because you're going to create flanges on both the sides. This is another piece of six of proline and again, uh, a low temperature pottery is taken and again a flange is created. So it all depends upon how much area of iridodialysis you have that you might be needing to do these passes. So in this, I think two, twice, if you do it twice, it suffices the need. So again, this six of proline will be again threaded into the barrel of this and it will be pulling up. So uh, this, is, these, this is one flange which is created on one side. Now what actually happens is that you also have a suture sutures coming out from this side. So you're going to create with a low temp pottery, you are going to create another flange here. So there will be two flanges which will be holding the iris tissue into the periphery. And that is uh, how this technique derives its name. So you will cut down the extra suture, which is lying here. This goes off. And then again, you try to create a flange till this flange goes, it's, it's, till it achieves its proper size. And then you just push it back into the scleral room. And then you can just close off this uh, conjunctiva either with a cautery or um, with a fibrin glue, whatever uh, is available in your practice. So now practically there are two flanges on both the sides that hold this peripheral iris tissue into its place. And it really holds on very well. So this is one of the methods, like if you have some traumatic iridodialysis kind coming up, you can do it in your uh, thing. Otherwise we have various other techniques also, uh, which we uh, try to do in these cases. Uh, Dr. Shans, please do let me know if I'm running uh, out of time. So this is uh, another method. This is a two-fold technique for iridodialysis repair. This technique was again described by in the Journal of the Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And um, this is actually a combination. Sorry, I just skipped the video. This is just a combination of uh, the uh, non-oppositional repair along with a single pass for fibroblastic procedure because now comes in the combination of the procedures. If you have a lot of iridodialysis, this is a traumatic iridodialysis. You have a lot of iridodialysis there. So you need to reposit this entire periphery of the iris tissue into the base. So uh, you will be needing multiple approaches because not one single approach is going to uh, suffice for this patient. So once this is actually a case with a secondary oil fixation, which needs to be done for this case, uh, initially what you try to do is that this is a big iridodialysis. So you first need to fix it off. If you do not fix it off, you have to use an iris hook and you have to clear up the central area and then you have a central area, you can do a secondary oil fixation, release the iris hooks, and you can again do this procedure. But you can do it uh, in the beginning also. So you just take a double arm suture, which is actually needed for uh, these cases. And through the uh, uh, periphery, through the base of the iris tissue, you just pass this, and then you railroad this, and you bring it out through the scleral tunnel. And then you just pull both the suture ends, and the entire thing comes off uh, along with it. 
So this was basically described by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Snyder from Cincinnati. And uh, this, we call it as a hangback technique, or you also call it as a non-oppositional technique. So uh, you keep on doing this till you have the entire area of uh, iridodialysis that needs to be repaired. And then you can just go ahead and do a secondary aisle fixation method. And um, uh, that is how you come across this. So I think I'll cut short this video for the secondary aisle fixation. I'll just try to show you one thing. Uh, one thing for newcomers who are venturing into the iris repair procedures, I would just like to tell you that, you know, it's very uh, essential that when you pass the initial suture, you should not imbibe the corneal tissue into the needle. If you imbibe the corneal tissue into the needle, your surgery will fail because when you will try to pull the suture, the loop is not going to slide inside the eye and it will remain as it is and it will add to your frustration because the iris tissue is already so fragile and you're not in a position to do the procedure. So I'll just try to show you one of the newer methods which, have, which have, we, have, uh, we have recently described in the European Journal is the trocar assisted non-oppositional iris repair. So what actually happens in these cases is, uh, you just I'll just put this off here. You just take a uh, 25 gauge trocar, place it into the anterior chamber, and then you take uh, a double arm suture and you pass it through this. So this barrel of the needle actually, uh, it prevents the uh, imbibement of the peripheral corneal tissue. If you feel that, why do I need to use a trocar to do all those things? Uh, what you can do and what I also often do is, you know, you can uh, even take a spatula, an iris spatula, you can place it and you can slice, slide the needle over it so that it does not imbibe any corneal tissue and it touches the spatula and it goes inside. So this is one of the clinical points which is very important to doing this. So we just uh, happen to describe this as a trocar non-assisted, uh, trocar assisted non-oppositional repair. Uh, wherein procedure is the same, but it is just that it helps you to prevent the imbibement of the corneal tissue inside this. So these are some of the things which I just wanted to show you that maybe if anybody is interested in going into the uh, repair, uh, they can use uh, some of these surgical techniques and procedures and they can uh, optimize their uh, visual outcome in their cases. Uh, I think um, I should close it down. And uh, if anybody has uh, any questions in the audience, you can just email me. My email uh, ID is below. Uh, because I cannot cover everything out here, but I can definitely reply to your mails. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Priya Naran, uh, for your excellent presentation and excellent videos. You did really a word. Uh, it's a really a word, actual word. Uh, congratulations. And uh, for everybody, he, he, he uh, she has already awarded for these videos and, uh, and uh, she's really a specialist in the people repair, Irish repair, and uh, we are uh, really delighted to have you with us. Do you have any comments uh, from any, uh, it's open, um, uh, please. I just, uh, I just have a question, yes, uh, yes. Dr. Priya. I mean, uh, uh, I, we understand that once the iris is injured, there could be uh, lentil opacity and you will remove the cataract and you will place the intraocular lens. But the thing is, uh, if, if you find the lens is clear, do you go for, uh, do you uh, will go for, I mean, uh, for iris repair? Uh, well, this is a very uh, tricky question, but uh, it's a very genuine thing that uh, if there is only a uh, iris tissue defect, first thing, and if the lens is clear, that's what I think your question is. Uh, indirectly, the question is that, would you do an iris repair procedure in a normal lens? That's it. Uh, actually, you have to be very careful when you're doing an iris repair. Let me tell you, any intervention into the anterior chamber with a clear lens can lead to cataract formation. So that is first thing. Uh, secondly, you have to assess how much amount of iris tissue damage is there. If suppose if it is a very minimal kind of thing, which does not cause any visual disturbance to the patient, you can leave it as it is. And you can explain to the patient that, look, this is the condition and uh, you might do well uh, without any intervention. But if there is a very big iris defect or something, and if the patient is symptomatic, patient has uh, visual disturbances or glare or photophobia or whatever because of the iris uh, tissue, you need to take the patient into confidence and you need to explain. Now, at this point, you have to take many things into consideration. What is the age of the patient? Suppose if the patient is young patient, uh, probably uh, then things are again tricky. Uh, because a young patient with a normal lens and taking away the accommodation of that patient, actually, it's not pardonable. So you need to explain to the patient if the patient is ready. You, 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 you might even end up saying the patient that this procedure might cause you cataract. First thing is that 
no matter how good your hands are, no matter how good your surgical hand is, you might touch the anterior lens capsule and it might lead into it. If the patient is ready, you have to say that we need to uh, do this procedure with lens extraction, if that is the case. So I think it's a very tricky thing, but yes, you have to be very clear in what you are doing and need to, you need to explain to the patient. So I think it all depends from uh, the surgical scenario, the clinical condition which is present at that moment. Um, uh, can, I, uh, uh, can I have two questions for you? Dr. Pia? Yeah, sure. Yes. yes. Uh, one is, uh, what needle, uh, you are using the proline suture for this uh, single pass for through people of plastic, but yes. uh, 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 what proline suture? It is 10, 10 It's a polypropylene. Or it, you can use a 10 or a 9 -o, but I prefer to use a 9 -o. A 9 polypropylene okay. suture I'm using, a double arm for an iridodialysis and a single arm for a uh, single pass for through. And what is your experience about the post iodialysis repair uveitis? Do you feel uh, that after uh, this repair, the uveitis uh, will be aggravated after this? Uh, no, not exactly because uh, you no. If it is associated with a secondary oil fixation, you might see some kind of inflammation because it all depends how much amount of damage has been there, how much amount, how much manipulation has go, going on, uh, uh, how many surgical interventions you have done. Because you are handling the vitreous also when you are doing a secondary oil fixation, you have a vitreous element. So uh, I mean, I mean, yes, you might have an inflammation in the post-op period. I don't deny it. Yes, it is possible you have an inflammation, and you have to uh, take care of the inflammation also. Because at the end of the day, you are handling a uveal tissue, and which gives inflammation. So let us accept that. Okay. Do you have any comments from in, uh, from the panelists? Hey, can I ask one thing, Dr. Shams, to Dr. Yes. Narek? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Amit. Where, very, very nice talk. Uh, have you tried any other suture like Gortex suture or, or any other suture apart from Proline? Gortex sutures we are not using for iris. Gortex sutures we use for back fixations. Yes. So for iris, uh, I think we Just are not Proline, using. Yeah. Yeah. Proline, yeah. Nothing else. Okay. Nothing. Thank you. So thank you so the much. Was, uh... The war was so hard, but very <laughs> smoothly yes. and very politely yes. with the soft hand, Priya has yes. managed. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm uh, I'm requesting now uh, uh, Professor Partho Vishesh to start his presentation on traumatic cataract management. Uh, Professor Partho Vishesh, now the time is yours. You can start your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Man, and. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes. Slide is visible, but, uh, but still no presentation okay. there. Yes, okay. it's visible now. Right. So it's uh, definitely been a war, and uh, a war has been won for every one of our presenters who have really elucidated the wonderful nuances of each of the topics. I'm so sorry to have been late and have missed uh, the first few presentations, but the later ones by Dr. Priya and uh, by Dr. Parth Pratim were excellent. Thank you so much. So the traumatic cataract and uh, this is... So the traumatic cataract and uh, in this uh, we come to the uh, different situations where such cataracts can occur. And uh, we do remember that these cataracts are associated with other comorbidities of the eye itself. And I'm going to present a few cases and uh, I would like to have your opinion and we'd like to learn from each other what could have been done and where I faulted, where I flawed. So this is a case of a traumatic cataract and this patient, a young patient, but he had waited nearly 15 years after the cataract. And this is what the cataract was when he first presented to me. So this cataract, a rock hard brown cataract, and it was nearly half popping into the anterior chamber when we first examined. So we planned out the cataract and uh, this is what we had to do for this patient. We had to give viscoelastic and this viscoelastic is important in this case, but it also comes with a difficulty. The difficulty is that 
once the viscoelastic, and this was a high molecular weight viscoelastic that we used, and here when we do have an anterior chamber through which we can work, but how do we get the tripan blue to stain such a hard cataract where no view is visible? So here the technique is to smear the tripan blue and to go ahead or off with the smearing and to smear as much as possible so that we do have a good stain. Without a good stain, the anterior capsular excess can be a very, very difficult proposition and can run out. Even at points where the capsular excess is not visible and the stain has not taken up properly, again, a little bit of maybe rewash and restaining is something that should be done so that you have at the end a good capsular excess because that is the essence of a good traumatic cataract surgery. So here we come to this phase where we have been able to perform a good capsular excess and we put in the capsular hooks. And once the hooks are in place, the lens is nice and stable. So here we have over 180 degrees of subluxation. And with this 180 degrees of subluxation, we do know that there are many maneuvers, many devices that have to go in. But the first of these devices is the CTR. And this has to go in very well. And so that the lens capsular bag becomes well centered. So once it is well centered, a very, very gradual hydrodissection, and we are able to rotate this nut of a nucleus in the capsular bag. So once it rotates, now the disassembly of the nucleus and the whole capsule is, as usual, filled up with this hard nut. So a direct chop is one technique that has to be attempted because with a, such a hard cataract, if uh, sculpting is done, it dissipates so much more energy. And remembering the fact that the maneuvers should be very, very gentle. And you can see that the capsular bag is being held so well with the capsular hooks. And I've got a capsular, uh, 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 a break in the nucleus and to the periphery. And the first pie is the most important pie of this whole maneuver. So if the first pie is done, then we are able to go ahead and continue with the other pies of the nucleus. So gradually the nucleus comes out and uh, it is a lot of patience. It is a lot of gentleness that all these nuclear fragments need to come out. So viscoelastic, viscoelastic and viscoelastic cover is the mantra and with a good viscoelastic cover, gradually the nucleus can be disassembled. And then the intraocular lens, we had chosen a single piece intraocular lens, but in all traumatic cases, a multi-piece lens that can go into the sulcus as and when required, always should be there in the OR, along with all the devices that we have. So here we have to fixate this uh, capsular bag. And once the lens is in place, so here is what we did. Now, uh, I would like to uh, tell you here that this is, uh, uh, at this point of time, what we had was a little bit of a mishap. Uh, and the amid segment that I was supposed to use had fallen on the floor. And what sister gave me instead was a broken Sioni ring. So this Sioni ring is the only device that I had with, um, uh, with me in the operation theater, and I fixated that device. One thing that I had to do at this point of time is knowing very well that this device had a broken edge, which was an edge that was uh, a ragged edge. So that ragged edge I cauterized, and then I placed it in the bag so that the ragged edge would not puncture the capsule at any point of time. So having done that, we closed the wound and uh, the patient was had a well-centered IOL with a fixated bag. Uh, let us look into the next case. And this is again a case in which we have a subluxated lens. We need to use devices and... 
Now here again, it is a nearly 180 degrees subluxated lens. And the first step that we do is to try and seal that opening to the vitreous by high molecular weight viscoelastic. The second thing and the most important thing, I try and center the rexis on the subluxated lens. That means we have to be a little eccentric to the cornea. So we have placed in the five millimeter uh, uh, marker of the capsule and with the uh, initiated with the capsular tome, but at the end, the capsular excess has to be completed with the micro forceps. And the micro forceps and the micro scissors are very, very important tools in this. And the edge of the micro forceps has to be very nice and accurate, has to be atraumatic and has to be well accentuated. So the next thing that we do, and this is going a little outside the principle of a traumatic cataract, and I've created uh, the main port from the area where the subluxation is most. And then I'm putting in the CTR. Why did I do it? It was a very deep seated eye and I could not get good access from the superior side. So I went ahead and uh, entered the main port from the temporal side. And then here we are holding on to the capsule by the iris hooks, which are also devices that can be used in such situations. And I'm specifically showing this video so that our younger surgeons, if they do not have capsular hooks, which are more atraumatic, can use the iris hooks instead as well. The next important part of a traumatic cataract disassembly is the rotation of the nucleus. And if it does not rotate well, which means that there is an obstruction, the uh, hydrodissection has not taken place, and the hydrodissection per se in itself is a maneuver that has to be gentle with small, small squirts and has to be done well. Otherwise, it will not. The next part, of course, is I'm taking out the iris hooks out of it and the CTR, you can see a part of the CTR, which means it's a well subluxated bag. So here again, we need to use the devices. And first we place in the intraocular lens and then I would go ahead with the device to, uh, to center the capsular bag. So once the intraocular lens is nicely in place, we need to see whether there is any amount of vitreous. And there is vitreous in the anterior chamber. And so we do a vitrectomy of the anterior chamber. And as soon as the vitreous has been removed from the anterior chamber, the next part is, of course, the lens becomes a lot more stable. Here, I should have resorted to a Hoffman's pocket, and that would have been a much more elegant technique if I had created this Hoffman's pocket initially before opening up the uh, of the uh, eye or making any of the ports. But uh, this, of course, is not a very elegant way of doing a sterile pocket, and uh, you can see it's a little ragged. And then we place in the amid segment well inside. And once the amid segment is placed, and here again, we need to reiterate that one segment would do well enough for these eyes where it is not a case of progressive zonulopathy. A traumatic cataract with zonular dehiscence will not dehisce the rest of the zonules most of the time unless there, is, there are any other factors to it. And therefore, we can rely on the rest of the zonules to hold the bag. So here in this case, one, uh, so one um, amid segment would be good enough for this. So we place in the amid segment, and it, is, uh, it can very well center this uh, bag. And all the time that we do these maneuvers of the railroad technique, uh, if there is loss of the viscoelastic, the viscoelastic has to be replenished time and again, because if this is not done, then uh, naturally there will be a shift of the anterior uh, part of the, the IOL bag complex, and then we will have trouble. So repairing the tissues is important. And of course, seeing whether any amount of iris repair needs to be done, any of the other structures need to, to be uh, seen. And at last, of course, it is important to put in tricot 
and see whether the vitrectomy has been complete in these eyes because the vitreous what you cannot see through the microscope becomes extremely well delineated when you put in try amsinal roll and then of course uh, putting in the suture i have opened the speculum a little and before i finally close the conjunctiva and see that there is a well formed ac the loosening of the speculum is definitely a must uh, I come to my last video, and this is a video with uh, a lot of memories. And uh, this patient we call Bhuvan. And he's a gentleman who first came to us with a huge amount of repair, and there was vitreous hemorrhage. We thought there was a foreign body also in the eye, and there was a slash of the cornea. We, we did a primary repair, and as you can see, there is traumatic aniridia as well. And with this aniridia, uh, we waited for four months and after four months we took this patient up for the cataract surgery. So we have here an aniridia that is there, a primary wound that has been repaired and uh, what we need to do is to remove the cataract. There is not much of iris tissue and we cannot salvage it and we need to take care of that part as well. So uh, a very gentle hydrodissection and uh, hydrodelamination and in all these cases as you can see that the handling of the nucleus is very, very important. And at any point of time that you think that uh, the bag cannot be well centered or it, you're having difficulty with the bag fixation, the devices must come in. And the devices are great uh, of great importance of for all these traumatic cataracts. And uh, straight chop uh, uh, is a very, very good way. However, the other methods also work. However, but the dissipation of energy is always there. But whatever you are comfortable with will do the job. And in this case where we had actually thought there would be a possibly a foreign body uh, actually had disappeared and there was no foreign body, it was just an artifact. And here you can see that I'm putting in the intraocular lens right in place and there is still a fragment there. Why? Because I thought that I had ruptured the posterior capsule or there was a dialysis. But uh, thankfully, there was no dialysis, no rupture of the posterior capsule and we removed that uh, the part of the nucleus after placing in the intraocular lens. So then comes in the reconstruction of the iris and the iris gets reconstructed by these two re uh, reconstruction rings. And I specifically want to tell you that these reconstruction rings are quite bulky and all of it goes into the bag. So the bag has to be a stable bag and you can imagine there are four devices that have gone into this bag, this traumatic bag. So just think of the strength of the zonules, the God-given strength of the zonules that is there. So the intraocular lens is there, the CTR is there, and these two bulky reconstruction devices have also gone in. And they are getting manipulated, they are getting shifted, and, uh, you know, uh, at the end of uh, everything, it is a well-centered bag and a well-constructed iris. So we call this patient Bhuvan and we made a short film of Bhuvan and this and Bhuvan achieved a vision of six, nine and six. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Professor Parthavishas, for your excellent presentation and excellent video documentation. Thank you. And Thank we you. really enjoy it. And uh, I'm, uh, do you have any questions, the honorable panelist? Uh, we are running short of time, actually. Uh, do, uh, if you have comments, Dr. Rajesh Sinha? Yeah, uh, actually, the surgery is very good and uh, mind blowing, Dr. Partha. I must congratulate you for that. Uh, yeah. Only the, the last case, will you prefer a, uh, an aniridic lens instead of uh, putting three, four things? Uh, yeah, Rajesh, you're quite uh, correct there. An aniridia lens would also be uh, a very good option. In fact, at that point of time, the aniridia lens was not available with us. So we did, we could procure uh, these uh, reconstruction rings and we went ahead. One another small point that I would like to uh, tell you here, these um, uh, reconstruction rings are indigenously made and they Today, it's, uh, this patient is eight years uh, from the day of surgery. He still comes back every six months to have his eye checked. And there's no chaffing or there's no, um, the pigments of the 
the reconstruction devices are still very much intact and there is no glaucoma and uh, of course we were very lucky with such an amount of trauma there was no post operative rise of intraocular pressure and uh, has been maintaining such for what was time. the vision vision of this patient <laughs> yes, uh, six, is nine. Six, nine. six nine. Yes, six, six nine. nine. Mind boggling. <laughs> this is mind boggling. Very good. We call him Bhuvan. Bhuvan after oh. Lagan. Lagan ka Bhuvan. <laughs> yes. Very excellent. good. Excellent. So, excellent. What, uh, what about the toxic lens syndrome? If it is a traumatic cataract, you know, the lens induced uveitis, and uh, when you, you are doing the cataract, what should be the time limit? I think uh, 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 Dr. Parthopati Majumdar and Parthopishas, both you can comment on this. This is a common question for the residents. Yes. So uh, the time limit. So do, when the first, when the patient first presented to us, there, as you could see, there was nearly uh, 100, uh, about 160 degrees of rupture of the cornea, and it was a concentric rupture on one side. So the, our first and uh, most of the iris was popping out, and we thought that possibly vitreous was also coming out. But very luckily, when we did the first repair itself, uh, the anterior segment settled quite well. There was vitreous hemorrhage as, as we showed, and there were artifacts which we thought there was uh, intraocular foreign body, but it was not there. The cataract change was not there at that point of time, or minimal, it was minimal. So our first intention during the first primary repair was to restore the integrity of the globe. Do nothing much, do just to restore the integrity of the globe, and which we did. And it really paid off extremely well because in four months, the anterior segment settled, it became quiet. The posterior segment, the vitreous hemorrhage disappeared and we could see the fundus and what we did see that uh, the fundus was quite good and there was no intraocular foreign body, even on the ultrasound or otherwise. And then when the patient started losing vision because of the cataractus change that was coming on, then we thought of doing the cataract surgery. So we did not hasten into the cataract surgery, I think, which was a saving grace. And even the macular status was very good. Um, um, the uh, OCT, et cetera, what we had done was extremely good. And so we thought that, yes, we could restore good vision for this patient. Thank you, Professor um, uh, uh, I think Professor uh, Parthupati uh, uh, Majumdar is there. Dr. Parthupati Majumdar? No. Hello. Okay, you can ask, uh, request okay. our next speaker. Okay, so um, I am requesting uh, Professor uh, Dr. S. Natarajan to start his presentation about the traumatic retinal detachment. And uh, uh, I'm uh, Professor Natarajan, sir. Are you there? Hello. We cannot hear him. Hello. Hello, Professor Dr. Natarajan. I'll just call him. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. 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 Not Rajan yes. is here. Yes. Okay. I just came in a relaxed mood. <laughs> oh, with Achi. Yes. Uh, yes. No Achi. Yes. Okay. Yes. So should I do my presentation? Yes. 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 You will start. Right. I'll just share my screen. Yes. Yes. So now we can share your screen. So this is a case of a road traffic accident who came with a closed frontal retinal detachment and supracoronal hemorrhage. So this was a 34 year old male presented with a closed frontal detachment with supracoronal hemorrhage following the road traffic accident. So I took her up uh, after the corneal wound repair was done. And then the, uh, the surgeons actually said that nothing more can be done. So when they refer to me. So I you can see that temporal retina is incarcerated to the uh, uh, nasal retina. And uh, it's like a total flow, like a flat, totally closed. Then I use the chandelier illumination 
use uh, two four port vitrectomy. The two ports I used uh, two forceps, separated the folds, injected the perfluorocarbon liquid in the in the open the funnel. You can see the retina is attached now. I'm gently stroking with the retinal brush and flattening the retina under the PFC. I'm also doing the endolaser photo correlation in the 360 degrees. There's already 300 degree giant that will tear was there. The rest of the 50 degree, I actually uh, increase the relaxing retina to me. And you can see some coronal data has been residual present, but uh, I, I didn't know, I didn't think that the, I will, the retina will open, but you can see the corneal sutures and uh, which was there and through the corneal sutures I used. So this is the preoperative view with the total detachment and then still the central corneal suture is there and the retina was attached. So this, this was a case where I wanted to say that uh, usually uh, people want to give up. So the, I, I don't give up. So I have to, any complicated retinal detachment, I make sure that uh, I do my best, but I spend a lot of time uh, before uh, I start the surgery with the patient. So we lost your screen. No, I'm just, uh, I just, uh, yeah, I'm sharing. Yes. So this is another uh, traumatic retinal detachment with the uh, inferior PVR where uh, we need a relaxing retinectomy. So the historical review, the first description of relaxing retinectomy doing past, past convertectomy was done by the father of Petrius City, Robert McMurr, and then later Dr. Elder Jovanovich, who's the father of modern retinal detachment surgery, particularly with silicon oil, and who has done the maximum number of retinal surgery at that time. He retired in 96, he was my second mentor. I'm glad I, I have observed both and worked with them. And, Bruce McLean, who has worked a lot in the relaxing retinectomy and published in AJO, and who was also with us in Mumbai. So the main thing is to, when you have a very severe traumatic PVR, where to do the uh, circumferential uh, or a vertical uh, relaxing retinectomy. So it's critically important that all traction has to be released posterior to the retinectomy side. Sometimes there's membrane on the surface of the retina or behind the retina. So I usually make sure that the retinectomy site is uh, diatomized so that you have hemostasis because if you leave blood or there is some ooze, the blood also can be a cause of recurrent PVR. And already the challenge in a traumatic retinal detachment is PVR. And here you see one publication by Mancino where uh, uh, the plain past kind of protection is there. Ask and I will take me the relaxing technique and see like a world map the end of the is done. And uh, so they also the, uh, feel, uh, compared the, when you do a buckling versus uh, inferior rectectomy in a retinal detachment with PVR with the vitrectomy, and there was uh, anatomically not much. So the buckle, if you have an inferior retinectomy done, you don't need a, a clear buckle. So the decision to perform and relaxing retinotomy or a retinectomy, they usually made during the surgery after complete membrane removal. Even though you can plan it well, you can have the Steve Charles uh, algorithm. And I also have a mental algorithm, what I will do, like a game plan in a, uh, like a football match. Uh, failure to extend retinotomy to the normal retina or to exercise the anterior flap may allow retinal proliferation and contract to re detach retina. And that is a real challenge in a traumatic retinal detachment. And, uh, Circumferential re relaxing retinectomy are referred to radial relaxing retinectomy that again depend on the case. So uh, the tamponade following a relaxing retinectomy, the silicon study reported significantly higher rates of post-operative hypertony in gas treated eyes compared with the silicon oil, silicon oil injected eyes. So relaxing retinectomy, retinotomies and retinectomies in the management of retinal detachment with severe PVR, the anatomy can visual outcome at six months. So you can see the retinal detachment is about 29%. Post-operatively, the best color visual has improved in 23%, stable in 7 and worse in, uh, in, in 8, I about 21%. So post-operative complication, recurrent retinal detachment in 18%, hypertension in 5 and epimacular membrane in 8 So this is the difficult part to explain to the patient. And that's why I'm, I'm sharing my experience. Here is a 65-year-old pseudo-fake male where uh, they follow uh, total retinal detachment following a trauma. The scleral buckling was done, but he came oh, with a, uh, he, he 
came with a, came with a recurrent recurrent attachment with PVR with multiple recurrent breaks, and you can see the recurrent tears all around and the total fixed poles at 360 degree. And I'm using a retinal force to remove the membrane from the peripheral retina. And I thought in the beginning of the surgery, I will not do a, any rela relaxing retinotomy or a retinectomy. I, I was always sure that we can remove the all membrane, but I'm now in between the surgery, I'm doing an endodrainage and doing fluid air exchange. When I do that, I see the subretinal air happening that is indicating that the traction is not relieved because there are no membranes seen on the surface of retina or on the posterior surface. That means there's a thickening of retina because of the PVR. So I'm doing a relaxing retinectomy under air. And um, many people don't uh, like to do that, but it's uh, controversial. And I think few people in the world do, myself and Steve Charles, and you can see that a uh, retina is getting contracted. And that is because, because the retina is thick and contracted, it does not go to the contour of the back of the back wall of the eye. And that's why you have to cut. And now I'm cutting the anterior retina all around 360 degree. The idea is to remove all the scar tissue with the PV retina in the periphery. And you see, after doing relaxing retinectomy, almost 360 degree, like a world map, it is with the irregular cut retina. The idea was to keep the uh, optic disc area and the macula attached, and then some part of retina, healthy retina around, so that you have attached retina to prevent recurrent attachment. So you see, under the perfluorocarbon carbon liquid, the retina is totally attached, and I've done 360 degree laser. And then I do PFCL silicon oil exchange. In many eyes, I use Denzilon. I don't have any financial interest, and you can see the preoperative patient with a total detachment and a postoperative with attached macula 636 with the oil on. And many times, if it is one eye and you remove the oil, you have to be ready to re inject oil. Sometimes you remove the Denzilon and use the 5000 centistrokes oil. I can remove, and in case there is early PVR happening as a post uh, silicon removal, I think you have to make sure you, you enter again into the eye. So sometimes we operate five times, six times, seven times, uh, traumatic uh, PVR. So this is a second patient who the a reason uh, is actually a uh, retinal array detachment, a bell buckle vitrectomy done uh, earlier on high myo, and you can see the high myopic eye and a total retinal detachment with a recurrence. So I again remove all the membranes and you see that the, uh, uh, the total uh, uh, holding was there and there was a posterior retinal break. I'm doing an endodrainage through the posterior retinal break and you see the retina is getting attached. There are already cold scar. Uh, and then uh, in the periphery, the retina is taken and there are some scars because of the injury. So at present, I'm doing again relaxing retinectomy under air and I'm also cutting the anterior retina Again, to uh, because the retina is uh, uh, contracted, and uh, you can see when I'm doing the anterior retinectomy, the retina is getting contracted. Sometimes you can go into an inoperable state where the entire retina curls over the uh, optic disc. But here, at least once the peripheral retina was cut, you can see the posterior retina was uh, little mobile, and then I'm using the retinal brush to uh, segregate the retina and put it back and uh, plastering against the foreye. And then the, under the PFCL, I use the laser, and then I do a PFCL oil exchange uh, that I do with when the silicon oil is through the infusion port, and then PFCL is removed to the bimanual uh, visco, viscous fluid injector. So this is a preoperative vision, and then that's the post-operative with about six by sixty vision after the oil removal. So uh, take-home message. Relaxing retinectomy or retinotomy and improve the curative effect of complicated retinal detachment in a trauma, uh, post trauma with PVR. However, there are potentially serious complications of these maneuvers that should uh, they should not be performed if less aggressive measures will suffice. So I want to remind everybody that uh, Charles Kippens always mentioned do the least to reattach the retina. So you should do everything possible to do, uh, do the reattach the retina, but at the same time, do as much as minimum possible. And also you should remember, minimum it should not be that you should be uh, not do relaxing retina where there is indicated, or if the retina is not going back. And if you don't uh, cut the retina in the periphery, the retina will not settle. So the management in a given patient with a traumatic retinal detachment is a patient specific and cannot be generalized for all such, such cases. So the experience comes, so that's what I tell each patient 
that in fact i've done i think maybe i've done the maximum number of iterations surgery in a tertiary care center for a trauma in the world but still whichever patient i operate i don't know how the visual potential will be so the first question patient asks us, how will i get the vision and they say oh you have operated so many patients i have get vision i said no there are two hurdles in iteration surgery for trauma the first is anatomical success and the second is uh, the functional success so that's where operating more these patients i become spiritual and i also become a iteration psychiatrist so i learned to counsel the patient a lot before surgery so i don't perform a retinectomy as a primary procedure but i do think that this is effective approach frequently underutilized and with appropriate experience it can be extremely valuable technique for achieving better reattachment rate and improved vision in highly complicated traumatic retinal detachments so as a retinal surgeon one requires this is what i learned from dr vidyanath a lion's heart eagle's eyes and a lady's fingers so to be gentle patience and stability of the mind is a must for very difficult cases for any retinal surgery this is my three years or three generations of ophthalmology and again we are the 200 glorious years of modern ophthalmology thank you very much for the opportunity to bangladesh ophthalmic society thank you to professor shafuddin and dr shams and everybody thank you thank you, you have you, uh, heart, you have eagle sigh and also lady's finger <laughs> sure you yes. have um, everything is so, here So we are running uh, short of time. We have yeah. uh, more retina specialists here, including our respected Professor Ava Madam. So I am uh, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Geeta Lisa, Professor Deepak Nag, Dr. Tariq Raja, and Dr. Amir Rawan. All are retina specialists. So uh, I want to quick comments uh, from each uh, panelist and speakers. Dr. Geeta Lisa, yes, thank comment you so on, much. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I, I forgot to thank the. Um, Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh and also the Bangladesh Research Forum for inviting me. Such an honor uh, to be uh, uh, involved in this excellent event. So, uh, congratulations, Prof. Natarajan, for the excellent uh, presentation and the results are, I think, fantastic. Um, most of the traumatic cases uh, I manage, uh, maybe not so uh, many of them are are as lucky. But uh, yes, I, I do think that traumatic uh, detachments are usually um, complicated cases and need uh, individual uh, approaches. And um, also it may occur both in uh, blunt injury and also in uh, penetrating or perforating injury. And uh, may be uh, complicated with other pathologies aside from retinal detachment, such as um, um, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, retinal dialysis, A choroidal rupture, and in case of um, penetrating trauma, maybe there's IOFV, and also luxated lens into the vitreous cavity. So there are um, a variety of cases, as you shown in your first case. There's uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage. That's also uh, another uh, difficulty uh, adds to the difficulty of the uh, surgery. But um, I think, um, especially um, in, as you pointed out. In these cases, especially the traumatic attachments, although uh, more rare, but usually the cases are more severe. The penetrating trauma cases, there's a high risk of PVR. So I think uh, the uh, retinect, the relaxing retinectomy uh, would be very useful. I think in one journal it's mentioned that um, almost 40 percent of cases would need relaxing retinotomies. So I think uh, that's an approach I. Uh, I do uh, frequent, frequently as well. And I think the important uh, thing or, or important uh, uh, aspects of uh, managing the traumatic detachment, of course, besides the uh, careful uh, history taking, the mechanism of trauma, whether there's a possibility of uh, IUFVs or other complications, is to have a good uh, Imaging, we, I think we should employ the B-scan uh, ultrasounds and also OCT, and uh, we have to have a good view. So I think the uh, addressing the um, factors that may obscure our view of the retina, such as a traumatic cataract and also a high femur, that has to be addressed first. I mean, we have to have a clear view of the retina, have a, a good microscope, good viewing system, And I think we have to be ready. Uh, I think 
every traumatic cases, at least I feel that way, uh, is always uh, daunting. Uh, I always try to anticipate the surprises and we have to be ready with all the uh, armamentarium. We have to be uh, ready with the uh, PFCLs or heavy fluids, endodiathermy, the, uh, the dyes, and also uh, forceps. And also, I think uh, in my experience, I uh, almost in all cases, I prefer silicon oil uh, tamponade uh, for, the, uh, for the traumatic retinal detachment cases rather than gas. And uh, regarding the timing also, I think when to do a vitrectomy for a traumatic retinal detachment depends, of course, I think uh, the, the, the preferable time is uh, maybe up to two weeks, but I think in my uh, hospital, sometimes it's difficult uh, to do that fast. So, but, but I think um, within a month, maybe we, uh, we should uh, be able to treat these cases. Um, uh, yes, I think I think that's my comment. Sorry if it's too long. Thank you, Dr. Gitalisa, for your excellent comments. Uh, Dr. Tariq Rajali, please. Quick comments on this okay, Actually, uh, there are tsunamis of webinar, but I feel that today's webinar was very much informative and we have learned from cornea to retina through so many things. Uh, my few comments are actually, I have some portion to Dr. Natarajan. Sir, uh, why did you do the retinectomy under here? Yeah, that is my first question. Is it uh, to reduce the retinectomy site or uh, why not under fluid? That is one question. Number two, if I do from PFCL to air and then silicon oil exchange, what, what is your comment? And number three, uh, if somebody is a very difficult case of retinal detachment, if somebody wants to put the PFCL for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, uh, to flatten the retina, what is your comment, sir? Well, the first is under air, I like one because I can increase the intraocular pressure and uh, have, because of the surface tension, the bleeding is less. For example, you are cutting blood vessels and I usually I diathermis and then do it. And the second is you have to, before injecting the air, you should make sure all memories are removed on the surface of the retina and on the back surface of the retina, under surface of the retina. So that case, you know, that is because of the thickening of the retina, the retina is contracting. So in that case, I can do the extreme periphery, the uh, retinectomy. So that's the reason I do it under the air. And I think uh, under air, I, because I'm using the biome for the last 30 years, so I have a wonderful visualization for long. So many times people don't want to do under air because the visualization becomes a problem. And that's my, uh, uh, what do you call, unique uh, approach I do. And I think I'm doing relaxing retinectomy in, uh, from the last 34 years because of Joan uh, O'Hare and Macmillan Scott and 84, and that's how I remember Gita's mother used to bring patient from Indonesia to Mumbai that time. And even one of Raman Saman was there, he's no more now. He is, uh, used to attend all the vitreal courses which I used to do in 90s. So, uh, and the second question is uh, uh, P uh, PFCL air exchange, you asked? Yeah. Yes. Sir. So, the main thing is uh, in the managing giant retinal tear or after doing a relaxing retinectomy, there's always a possibility of uh, uh, retina slipping. So if you under a PFCL, the retina is stable. And then when you have a three-port uh, injection uh, through the infusion line and use the uh, the visc viscous fluid extract or a fluid needle in the uh, uh, dual mode, you'll be able to do uh, silicon injection and removal of the PFCL without any change in alteration. But if there's some fine uh, subretinal fluid is there, and under it, there's a possibility of the retina slipping. That means sometimes some retinal, some retinal fluid can be there. And that can be the cause for a recurrent PVR. And what is the third question? Oh, if somebody wants to put some PFCL in the, uh, that, that is for a couple of days or weeks. Yeah, there, there, are, there are publications where you can leave the PFCL for a, a week to two weeks. The only problem is the patient should be all the time lying down in a, a supine position because if he walks around, he becomes emulsified and becomes small. And uh, and according, I think now if we have to use a PFCL, I use Denzeron because Denzeron actually sinks down. So if you have a 360 degree retinectomy, and sometimes I also use a, a sandwich technique, a Denzeron up to two thirds of the eye and one third of the eye with a thousand centimeters. So if, and usually you don't see the meniscus difference and the patient doesn't have any problem. And some people earlier, I think in 2000, when the Denzeron, heavy oils were there from various companies, Bosch and Lom, wider, 
the it, purification was a problem, so it was producing emulsification. Now the highly purified heavy oils are coming. So even you can mix thousand, not mix, you use a two layer uh, sandwich technique and uh, where you can then remove the oil three months later. And if the eye is stable, you, you can leave the eye with the fluid only. Thank you. Okay. Professor Deepak Nag, uh, quick comments, please. Unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute. Deepak, unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, uh, the good videos definitely uh, for complex retina retinal. Actually, when the uh, retina become uh, uh, funnel shaped RD, uh, this is shortening shortening of the retina. Then I prefer only the realizing retina. As uh, uh, Professor Nutrajan uh, rightly mentioned, that um, uh, if you put PFC here. And then PFCL AR exchange your PFCL a silicone like change is not so easy and there is uh, every chance of you know uh, slipping of this uh, retina. So um, what I do because it's, it's most important thing is doing a good uh, vitrectomy and PBD is the very difficult thing particularly in case of trauma and if the child if the patient is young uh, children uh, this type of patient so. Uh, I always put, you know, this, um, if there is no, not severe PBR changes uh, and the retina is not shortened, I, I never go for um, relaxing retinectomy. I always put scleral band to make an artificial ba uh, vitreous base so that uh, um, uh, we don't need to uh, go for the relaxing retinectomy. Relaxing retinectomy is an, uh, another option. But uh, it has some, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult as well. So I always put a scleral uh, uh, band and uh, 2.5 uh, mm band so that I make an artificial vitreous base. And then I do the vitrectomy and uh, wants to do, you know, uh, as much as possible case of uh, uh, fake patient. So, and also I put silicone oil and the silicone oil uh, in, in this type of cases where uh, there is a, a huge number of chances uh, to become, you know, PBR changes, uh, I always put 5,000 CS uh, uh, silicon oil instead of 1,000 or, or 1,300 uh, 1, uh, CS silicon oil. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Deepak Nag. Dr. Amir Rahman, please, uh, quick comments. Uh, just a quick comment. I think we are already getting late. And uh, yes. Yes. yeah, uh, I think primary repair is very important. When, if it's properly done, uh, things would be uh, much easier for uh, retina colleagues to uh, do the things. And uh, early, we are referral is important. So if you look at the retina in earlier part of the injury, it's better uh, after the repair. Uh, other comment is about retinectomy. I think definitely I agree with Professor Natarajan. Retinectomy is a brilliant thing. Uh, because sometimes what happens because of so much repair and things, it won't be possible to put clear buckle or clear band from the outside. And you may put uh, more uh, damage to the sclera. So retinectomy works very well. Uh, another important thing, two to three surgeries. We have to tell your patients or it may not be one surgery to fix a problem. They may require more procedures. Uh, coming to the tamponade, uh, I think in my case, if it's a simpler retinal detachment, I may just put the gas. Usually I more often use gas, but if even slight complexity or moderate or more, it's better to use the silicone oil. And uh, the last thing which I want to uh, mention about heavy liquid, I think uh, the question was asked about, uh, there are a few folks uh, in the world who use heavy liquid routinely in, in simple retinal detachment. What they do is they just completely fill it. And after two to three weeks, they just remove uh, the heavy liquid. It doesn't cause much inflammation if you uh, leave it for shorter duration and works really well. But usually, I'm not fond of uh, leaving it. I would rather go for gas or silicon oil. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Dr. Amir Rawan, uh, for your nice presentation. I think there, there is, there is, that is a great war against the trauma. And we have won the war. Uh, uh, before uh, ending the session with Professor Sharfuddin Ahmed's speech, uh, I want to take a photograph. But please, yes. make a V sign, because we have won the game. Oh, <laughs> won the war. Please. OK. V sign. Side. Thank you. So I'm requesting uh, Professor Sharfuddin Ahmed uh, yes. to um, end the session with 
some very lovely speech. Thank you, Shams Muhammad Noman. Uh, you were the captain of this uh, war, and you own uh, on behalf of us. Professor Abha Hussain, Professor S. Natarajan, Professor uh, Rajesh Sinha, Professor Parthu uh, Pratim Bishash, uh, Dr. Parthu Pratim, Moju, uh, Parthu Pratim Mojumdar, Parthu Bishash, uh, Gitali Saab, uh, 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 Priya Naran, and Professor Kadet, Professor Tariq Rijali, and Professor uh, Deepak Nag. And uh, not the last one is uh, Dr. Amira Wan. Uh, probably he's 11.30 now. Uh, today in our country, it is 10.30, it is 11.30 in your country. Uh, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, uh, Indonesia, all are with us. I think this webinar has given a lot of idea to all the ophthalmologists and also all the residents who are attending our webinar. Uh, this type of webinar is the academic mm, performance and as well as the uh, latest technique which are very much helpful to all the ophthalmologists of the world. I think this type of webinar should be continued. And you people who have given a lot of time in spite of your busy schedule uh, to this webinar, I thank all of you. And I hope uh, face to face we will see. But before that, during this COVID period, if necessary, we will request you. I hope all of you will uh, uh, again come with us in the same screen in the same global village. And I hope Noman and Professor Kader, on behalf of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh and Bangladesh Ophthalmic Research Forum, they will uh, uh, always communicate with you. And we will uh, again see you together. Thank you very much and hope for your healthy life. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Madam. Yes, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Rajan is uh, with us. Hi, Rajan. Rajan is yes. here. Where is she? Gitanisha, Amirabhan. Okay, fine. Where is she? Where is she? My, my grandmother. Uh, I don't know who is your grandmother. Your grandmother? Ah, oh, so important. Oh, under so two. So lucky. Yeah. Under Madam, two years. Really? Madam, she is very so famous nice. internationally. Yeah. 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 So nice. And Dr. Rajan, I am giving you one information that your uh, Asian Pacific Academy Ophthalmic Trauma Society, we have yeah. already endorsed for full member uh, in our Asia Pacific that is endorsed in EC. Thank you. Not uh, associate member now. Okay, great. Oh, congratulations, congratulations, Dr. Rajan, so much. And it, it, will be, it will be final in the council, uh, of course, but uh, in the EC, we have already endorsed. Uh, I will request Rajesh Sinha to uh, give me the email address of Indian Medical Council. Can you uh, give me the uh, address of email of the chairman of Indian Medical Council? I'll do that, sir. I'll okay, do that. thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent also, presentation, Amir, Parthu. Thank you, madam. You were not here at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yes, and Priya, Priya is also very good. Excellent. And also, Professor Parthu Mojumdar. Yes, everybody. Yes. directly uh, mentioned Ita. one thing, that this webinar has given yes. a lot of yes. information to Ita. everyone. Ita. So, very yes, good. Yes, Thank you very much. A lot of, a lot of residents are uh, getting ad advantages and, and we will have the second one. Up. We will have the second one. I will declare later on. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. 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 Stay healthy and stay safe. Stay okay. Stay Let fine yes, will be given by Partho. Bye-bye, Archie. 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 Bye-bye, Hopefully, we will meet uh, all of you in Bali next next year. Yes, we yes. should yes. have been hosting yes. it this September, but uh, yeah, everything's postponed now. No, Hopefully. but uh, okay. you have next applied year. for 23, 2023, Ita? Oh, yes, the APAO. A APAO, APAO. 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 right. I'm but telling you that. Yes, Indonesian Ophthalmological it. Society will be in Bali? Uh, the APOTS, actually, the, the trauma. The trauma. That Congress will be in Bali. Or